I think we're ready to start, everyone. So, uh, good evening. And I welcome you all to this meeting of the Kadinya Shire Council and now declare the meeting open. Please note that this meeting is being held virtually and webcast live over the internet on Council's website. Uh, I'm going to start off with a, with a prayer. We, uh, Almighty God, we humbly request that you bestow your blessings upon this Council, direct and prosper our deliberations to the advancement of your glory and to the betterment of the peoples of Kadinya Shire. Amen. The Kadinya Shire Council respectfully acknowledges that we are on the traditional land of the Bunurong and the Wurundjeri people and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Apologies, we have uh, no apologies tonight, that's noted. Minutes of the previous meetings. Um, can I have a motion please to adopt the minutes of the previous meeting as listed? Uh, Councillor Colin Ross and a seconder please. Councillor Ray Brown. Uh, thank you, councillors. We'll now vote. All those in favour? I declare that carried. Thank you, councillors. Declarations of interest. I note that Colin Ross has declared a conflict of interest in Notice of Motion 1055. Are there any other declarations of interest to be noted? There being none, councillors. Um, We'll move along to ordinary business. The council conducts its meetings according to a consent, consent agenda. Councillors have advised of the matters for consideration this evening that they wish to discuss or debate. The remaining items will be adopted without discussion. Before mo moving to these uh, business matters, I will bring forward community question time as the questions, as one of the questions does relate to an item on tonight's agenda. We have received a series of questions from Tony O'Hara regarding the planning permit for the motorsports facility. I will refer these uh, the questions to the Chief Executive Officer, Carol Jeffs, to read and answer. Uh, Ms. Jeffs, over to you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, there's quite a few questions here and thank you, Mr. O'Hara, for submitting them, so bear with me. Uh, so the questions are, um, in reference to item 6.1.1 T190147 planning permit application for Cardinia Motor Recreation and Education Park, stage one. Um, so there's a little preamble for each question and then a question. So um, the preamble begins in DPO 16, it was recommended by Acoustic Consultants Marshall Day that respite packages which enable a resident to travel at times when the highest noise level events are scheduled. Uh, question is, I do not see any reference to respite in this planning application. Will Council enforce this suggested requirement? Uh, the answer is that this will form part of the noise management plan prepared along with the event schedules for endorsement by the Council. Specific arrangements made with individual landowners will be a matter between those parties and form part of the noise management plan. The second question is from page 10 um, in the report and the preamble is that the future precinct structure plans are yet to be fully developed, being Pakenham West, Pakenham South Employment and the Cardinia Road precincts. Ultimately, it's envisaged that these PSP areas will not be residential. The question is, will Council guarantee and put into writing that the land designated as Pakenham West Employment, Pakenham South Employment will not eventually be used for housing or other forms of accommodation. Uh, the answer is that Council will be working with state government agencies such as the Victorian Planning Authority and the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning to achieve the vision of their state policies um, and the South East Growth Corridor Plan to deliver state significant employment land to the south of the Princess Freeway through the future precinct structure plans. The ultimate decision of what land designation these precinct structure plans achieve is a decision for the Minister for Planning. Um, and specifically in response to the mentioned PSPs, Pakenham South PSP has been planned for 100% employment and should be on exhibition uh, later this year and has undergone a substantive planning process to date. Pakenham West PSP is not on any state government business plans at the moment. There's been no planning work undertaken. However, state government policy um, shows this land as industrial. 
Council will continue to work with state government and landowners to deliver employment land to deliver jobs for the future residents of Cardinia and our surrounding councils. Uh, preamble, page 12. It is proposed to use the motor racing track excluding setup pack down times during the following times, Monday to Thursday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., Friday to Sunday, 8 a.m. to 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. during winter hours and to 8 p.m. during summertime. Friday or Saturday for a maximum of two events per calendar month, 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. Now that the true scope on racetrack operation times has been declared and recognising the noise management plan will assist in managing noise limits, question is, do councillors think that up to 26 events per year to 11 p.m. will not have an impact on the amenity of the residents of Pakenham, especially Blue Horizons, Arden Estates and the Shanna Golden Aged Care Facility? Answer is the hours of operation that are referred to represent the base level of operating hours. The actual schedule of events and noise requirements will be assessed through the noise management plan and supporting acoustic reports. This will be reviewed and authorised by the council on a periodic basis that will allow adjustments to be made to each iteration of the noise management plan. Next one is from page 20 of the report, clause 21.04-5 tourism notes, support the development of tourist accommodation within the municipality, which does not adversely impact on the environment or affect the amenity of local residents. And ensure that tourism development is of a scale and design that is compatible with the locality and minimises adverse impacts on the environment. The question is, could you please confirm in writing that this insidious major motorsports complex known as the innocuous Cardinia Motor Recreation and Education Park will have no adverse impact on the environment or affect the amenity of local residents? And the answer is, Council assesses all applications within the requirements of the planning scheme including amenity and environmental considerations to minimise any adverse impacts. The conditions of this permit are designed to achieve this. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Ms Jeffs. A uh, written response will also be provided to Mr Ahara. Now back to the order of business. Um, the items withdrawn for tonight's proceedings are as follows. Item 6.1.1, .1, Planning Permit Application for Cadinia Motor Recreation and Education Park, Stage 1, uh, withdrawn by Councillor Brett Owen. Thank you, Mayor. I move the following. The Council issued Planning Permit T190147 for the use and development of a motor racing track and the removal of native vegetation at 75 to 115 Key Lane, Pakenham, Victoria, 3810, subject to the conditions attached to the report. Councillor Owen, um, and I have an indication that Councillor Brown would like to second this motion. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Uh, back to you, Councillor Owen, to speak to this item. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Firstly, I want to acknowledge, uh, obviously, the questions uh, raised by Mr O'Hara, and I uh, note the content of them and the answers uh, given by the CEO. So, long history of, of this site, very long history, uh, dates back to 2004. Uh, so, I'll try, I, I know Councillor's only got five minutes to speak, uh, so I'll try to be quick. Um, Council resolved to approve the development plan for the Cardinia Motor Recreation and Education Park under the Development Plan Overlay on the 12th of December 2019. The approved development plan provides a framework in which planning permits will be assessed upon completion. The development of the land will include a motor racing track, pit facilities, drive education centre, hotel, commercial developments, restaurant offices and function centre, sport shooting range and associated works, including car parking and drainage. As uh, the report talks about, there's been a number of amendments uh, through, uh, since 2004, and they're detailed in the report. But 
in reference to 335 McGregor Road, Pakenham, the parent site, which is wholly owned by Cardinia Shire Council, was subdivided into the lot configuration as described in the report. This was approved on the 4th of December 2017. So lot one is currently leased um, from the Cardinia Shire Council by the Pakenham Auto Club. Lot two is currently leased from uh, Cardinia Shire Council by the Kiwi Rutt Motorcycle Club under a uh, recreation licence and lot three was resolved to be sold to Podium One, and that's the application uh, before us. It's acknowledged that Council is involved with this proposal in several aspects, including being the landowner with a contract to sell the land and an economic driver to create investment in the region, as well as the responsible authority in assessing this planning permit application. This report provides an assessment of the merits of this planning application only. Nonetheless, a background into Council involvement to date is relevant. So Council did purchase the land back in 2004 and at a special Council meeting on the 23rd uh, of July 2018, Council resolved to sell Lot 3. Uh, Podium uh, 1 have submitted a planning application and that's for consideration tonight. So what is the proposal? This application is for Stage 1 and comprising the use and development of the land for a motor racing track, the remo removal of native vegetation and, and associated works. The project is primarily, will primarily occupy the land at 115 Key Lane in Pakenham. So the use and land of the motor racing track, um, the proposed racetrack is located centrally on Lot 3, being a 3.6 kilometre FIA Grade 2 FIM Grade B facility. The circuit has the ability to be split into smaller configurations, averaging 1.8 kilometres in length each which can be operated independently of each other. It includes a pit building. Uh, at ground level, the pit building will comprise of 33 garages. At first floor, a hospitality area viewing deck expands for most of the length of the floor. The building is proposed to be contemporary in design, clad with the uh, court and steel aluminium wall panels and concrete and aluminium roof, glass balustrades, electric roller shutter doors, steel staircases. Uh, it is proposed to use a motor racing track uh, and, and those times are listed in, in the report and they vary uh, from, from each day. Any use of the track outside these operating hours is proposed to be subject to additional approval from Council. And I note you know, that those questions was, was answered in relation to the concerns of Mr O'Hara about those times. Um, it is proposed to submit a event patron management plan as a condition of the permit. I know there was concerns about native vegetation removal. It is proposed to remove 9.37 hectares of native vegetation uh, listed as uh, endangered Gippsland Plains uh, bioregion, which also serves as a habitat for a significant fauna species, tree native scattered trees and potential impacts. So I believe the proposed conditions does address those concerns. Same with the noise. Um, the, the long long conditions uh, in, in the report. In relation to public notification, uh, pursuant to clause 43.04.3 at the planning, um, Academy planning scheme, once a development plan is prepared to the satisfaction of the responsible authority, all subsequent planning permit applications are exempt. So back in uh, December last year, that development uh, uh, plan was uh, adopted um, after a consultation process. It was referred to the Minister of Planning and um, uh, the application was referred to the Minister and the on the 14th of June this year, the Minister for Planning issued a decision uh, under Section 83, sorry, 8, 8B3, subsection B of the Environment Effects Act that the project site is subject to us, um, that he approves, uh, approves uh, this going forward. Uh, as long as the project site is subject to a specific land use planning framework that supports the development of motorsports facility. Um, also, uh, further conditions included an environment report must be prepared in consultation with Delwip prior to the commencement of works of flora and fauna management plan. The design of drain diversion, wetlands and associated drainage infrastructure needs to be com uh, completed and the environment report flora and fauna management plan will be completed. So they're all conditions of the minister for this to go forward. And they're also conditions as part of this, uh, this application that council officers are recommending for approval. So those concerns uh, are, are listed in, 
in in the uh, conditions of this uh, this permit. So um, I'll stop there. Um, I'll sum up uh, talking about the benefits uh, of of this. Uh, application for the wider Cardinia community and also the benefits to our local clubs. But I will stop there and let other councillors speak. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Um, I'll now go to Councillor Brown to speak to this item. Um, thank you, Mayor, and um, thank you, Councillor Owen, for that uh, lead-in. You haven't left much for me to speak about. Very comprehensive and well done. Um, some of the things Mr. O'Hara spoke about regarding the PSP, the surrounding lands, has been has been uh, answered by the CEO. Um, uh, the the um, structure plans are currently being developed: the Pakenham East, Pakenham South, and the Cardinia um, Road precincts. Envisage that the PSP areas will not be residential, so that allays a little bit of concern there regarding the residential um, development there. Um, as Councillor Owen said, there'll be a 3.6 kilometre track with the ability to split that into two smaller tracks of 1.8. So both of those small tracks can run concurrently with each other. And also the pit building in the northern northern uh, side of the uh, facility, 100 metres from the, the boundary line. The hours of operation have already been spoken about and I think they've been adequately covered. There were statutory bodies that had to have input into this um, this project, such as the um, uh, Melbourne Water, where a stormwater management plan had to be developed. Uh, they proposed a series of outfall drains and wetlands throughout the site, comprising a series of drainage strategies, uh, all sorts of strategies for each particular area of this site. Also, the, um, um, Building conditions, heights, etc., flood levels for the buildings on the site all have to be and will have to be complied with Melbourne water requirements. The removal of native vegetation was discussed, and Delta have had some input into that. They, um, the native vegetation report um, will be prepared and will be subject to the approval of the, the extent of the removal and must be confirmed by the responsible authority before any removal works take place. And prior to any removal, there must be evidence that the proposed offset of vegetation removed must be provided and credit extracts allocated to the permit from the native vegetation register. So what that virtually means is that you purchase credits and you remove vegetation and it becomes on the register there. There's not much more to speak about that Councillor Owen hasn't covered, uh, apart from that I believe the conditions throughout this decision provide the most appropriate means for ensuring adequate consultation and rigour is applied to these potentially significant impacts. We're talking about noise, we're talking about vegetation removal, we're talking about the impact on the surrounding properties, all of those impacts have been adequately, I believe, addressed in these controls. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Um, do I have any other councillors that would like to speak to this item? Uh, Councillor Schilling. Thank you, Mayor, and um, thank you, Councillor Brown, Councillor Owen, for um, speaking speaking to this item. Um, as Councillor Owen um, suggested in his opening remarks, this has been a, a long a long time um, coming this project for our Shire. Um, and there are elements of this proposal that I definitely support and see the benefits of, but there are also some within this project that we all as council and future councils need to be mindful of. Um, in terms of in terms of the permanent home for the motorcycle club and the and the motor club, I mean that's a great outcome. Um, these clubs have been um, requesting a permanent home for some time and have had a lot of uncertainty. To, to be able to um, secure some of this certainty is a fantastic outcome. Um, in terms of the jobs and the tourism to the Shire, I also think that it's, it's, a, it's a great outcome as well. Um, what I feel we need to look at uh, more carefully, and I think that it is, I think that it is um, covered adequately within the conditions of the report, but really does have to be enforced to an incredibly high standard is that around noise? Um, the reality is, is this track is going to be within 1.5, 1.8 kilometres 
of, um, of residential homes. And that is a significant impact if you consider um, some of the operating times on this. So, of course, within the within the report, within the within um, the plans, of course, there will have to be these acoustic reports submitted to council. And I really believe that council need to be incredibly proactive in making sure that these plans are sound, um, they're thorough, and also making sure that it is going to have minimal impact on the local residents. In terms of the environmental um, impacts of it, I'd also um, be asking that we are. Um, vigilant in uh, making sure that the um, environmental requirements are met. And it's a little bit disappointing to see that the minister um, ruled that the EES wasn't required for such a sensitive piece of land. But I am satisfied that some of these conditions um, on the print will, um, if we can uphold them, will uh, definitely go a long way to protecting that local, that local area. So I'm happy to support this initial planning, but I will be asking council uh, um, incredibly vigilant and proactive in making sure that all of these plans and conditions are met to the highest possible standard. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Schilling. Um, do I have any other councillors that would like to speak to this item? Uh, Councillor Ryan. Thank you, through you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Councillor Owen, for a good presentation. Um, both you and Councillor Brown have covered uh, most of it. Um, I just wanted to add um, a little bit to it and Councillor Schilling, thank you for your input. It has been a long time coming um, and I think for a good outcome, um, it is going to have a lot to do with um, how our community is going to interact with, um, with the, the motorsports and that that, that will happen. Um, if it's passed. Um, my concerns have, like probably the majority of you, has been the noise factor. But I think in keeping with the management plan and reassessing the noise with the decibels 12 monthly, then that's a way of managing um, the, the noise with the residents within um, the community. Um, traffic was another one that I was very concerned about. Uh, because there is a lot of uh, people that uh, do live down on the other side of the railway line already that's built up there. So um, I hope that it doesn't have a hindrance on, on too much of the traffic problems. And it's going to create employment for a lot of our people within our community. And that's what we've really got to think about too, is, is employment for, for people within our community and not having to travel too far. Um, and I think the retirement village, the ageing in place, um, being so close there, um, it is a factor that with the uh, retirement village, probably um, the community there would, would have some complaints. As far as the nursing home goes, a lot of the residents wouldn't be able to hear the noise, um, and especially if it's got um, events happening in the evening because a lot of them go to bed early with medication. So so there's those sort of things to look at as well. So that's that's considering that, you know, um, if people don't understand about uh, retirement villages and nursing homes, which my dad was in Shanna Golden. So, um, and I haven't heard any complaints from the residents there at this stage. It's not to say it won't happen. But I think, uh, yeah, I think those, some of those negative things that I've put out there, but also they're just really basically concerns that we we can get it um, over um, with the right management. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Ryan. Um, do I have any other councillors that would like to speak to this item? Um, okay, there being none, I'll go back to Councillor Owen to uh, summarise. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you all councillors for your comments. And I think you, you really said it well. I think I'm, I'm, I'm confident that the conditions around this uh, this permit will, will address the concerns raised by, by some, including Mr O'Hara. Um, this is the first stage of, of a fantastic you know, development. Um, this planning approval represents the first stage of the master plan featuring a racetrack, pit facilities and associated infrastructure. 
these facilities will also offer driver training and education, and that's something we need to really focus on as well, driver education. Future stages that include a hotel and other commercial uses, um, including that sporting shooting range, which is is, is uh, quite popular, um, other uh, commercial uses. In relation to the hotel, that's coming in uh, future stages. That is so important. We need accommodation op options. You know, uh, for the current crisis uh, in our um, in our community at the moment, uh, we've got people coming from all over. Uh, Australia to, to, to work in, in our area to help our community, uh, we need uh, decent accommodation. Um, so this uh, long-term uh, you know, uh, vision will provide that. And so estimated worth of this whole project, the full stage is $200 million. You know, think about the investment and jobs and, and that is so in, uh, important to our community. Um, in relation to our clubs, our local um, sports clubs, that being the Pack and Mordo Club and the Cooper Up and District Motorcycle Club, obviously they're heavily involved in this precinct. At the moment, they've got leases uh, for the other parcels of the land. The Pack and Mordo Club, they're staying where they are in, in Lot 1. Uh, they're happy. They're planning for their permanent um, accommodation. We're working with the uh, Cooper Up and District Motorcycle Club. We've got a steering group that Councillor Brown and, and I are on. Um, you know, we're, we've got really good uh, discussions with them and we're progressing that. And definitely uh, Lot 3 will be their short-term site and we're working with them for that long-term accommodation. And we know the sales, the sale of this land as a result of this application uh, getting approval, Council will sell the land to Podium 1 and all the proceeds of that sale will go to the two clubs to uh, for either uh, purchasing that uh, land for the Kurup Motorcycle Club or uh, their their accommodation both for both of those two clubs. So I think that is is something of benefit. But I I, uh, I think this is a great for our our, our Shire a two hundred million dollar investment. Um, the sale, um, there's strong conditions around the sale, and we want this moving. We don't want this to be uh, sitting still. There is strong conditions in relation to this project uh, 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 progressing. So uh, that is really good um, because we want this moving. We want that investment in our shire and and and, uh, and so forth. So I move the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Owen, uh, I'll now put this to a vote. All councillors in favour, please raise your hand. I uh, declare that carried. Thank you. Moving along to um, moving along to the second item for tonight, item six point one point five, submission to the APL AGL gas import jetty and pipeline environmental effects statement. Uh, withdrawn by Councillor Moore. Councillor Moore. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I'm sorry I had a good trouble with the buttons over here. Um, uh, yes, I'd like, just like to move the recommendation of the officer's report in the report. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Moore. And I have indication that Councillor Schilling would be would like to second this item. That's correct, Mayor. Uh, Thank you, Councillor Schilling. Um, I'll go back to Councillor Moore to uh, speak to this item. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this um, actually is a stage seven of the um, of the process here, which began in July 2020. Uh, there's many, many stages of this AES, and uh, this this is an ex exhibition of the proponents AES, an invitation for public comment, and that's the, the, where the stage is at. Um, Council Brown and myself um, were heavily in, involved in the initial consultation with, with the local landowners um, right from the very start two years ago. And so um, this um, application was actually attempted to be bulldozed through without any consultation, and that was um, the most disappointing part of the whole process. So to support our community, um, and I say from the wisdom of the um, Minister for Planning, to insist on having a AES, and that's where we are at the moment. Um, and, and there are many, many uh, items to, to this, to the recommendation of our of our um, process here. And, and I want to recommend or 
wholly commend our um, staff, uh, Tracy Parker and Theresa Hazendong, who have, um, have been involved in this right from the start, and which is pretty fantastic. And I want to show our appreciation for their hard work, because this is where it should be uh, to support our community. Um, it, it, it doesn't, you know, this endorses a submission of the Department of Environment, Water and, and Planning, generally in accordance with the Attachment 3, which details issues to be resolved generally relating to, and major ones, they are inconsistencies with the Renewable Energy, the Climate Change Act 2017, the Victorian Reduction Emissions Target, and incorrect insufficient data relating to the gas demands and sustainability of, of the proposal. Impacts of the groundwater have not been satisfactorily addressed and may exceed accessible levels. Inaccurate tra tra traffic impact data and a need for traffic management strategies to be prepared based on accurate information. Refinement of the, of the pipeline alignment to reduce impacts on the future viability of agricultural land in the green wedge zone. And insufficient information relating to ongoing impacts on all types of land holdings that fall within the 640 metre measurement length of, of the proposed pipeline. And no direct consultation, and this is very important, with owners and occupiers of the land holdings that fall within the 640 metres measurement length of the proposed pipeline. And that's what, we're, that's what this is about, Mr Mayor. Um, so the minimal, minimal consultation with, with, with our local landowners, our farmers, that is, our, our, our local, is a major issue. So that's why this is a, a, a really a big highlight, and I um, and I uh, welcome uh, Councillor um, Schilling uh, to speak on this because I know this is something close to his heart, and I, I know that he'll speak on this, and I'll leave it at that at the moment, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Moore. Uh, I will now go to the second, Councillor Schilling, to speak to this item. Thank you, man. Thank you, Councillor Moore, for um, withdrawing this important um, important report tonight and i couldn't agree with you more and you have covered covered the document incredibly well there has been a lot of community interest around this because this is a massive piece of infrastructure um, that is being proposed to uh, run run through our shire and um, to have no direct consultation with the major landowners is a significant issue when you have something as major as a major gas pipeline going through your community you need to engage with your local residents and that is um, absolutely not the way that you do community um, consultation. As Councillor Moore touched on as well, um, it's inconsistent with the way of the future. It's inconsistent with the Renewable Energy Act of 2017, the Climate Change Act of 2017, and also emissions targets. Um, something around impacts on groundwater not being assessed either. These are all major catastrophic issues that have not been adequately addressed in this EES. Um, so I'm glad that the Minister has asked for um, I guess, submissions to this EES, um, which has allowed us as a, as a council um, to have some robust discussion around what this would mean for our community and therefore be able to put a submission back um, into, this, into, this, um, into this process. Another thing that hasn't um, been addressed adequately is um, they speak in this report a lot about um, the, the future need for gas. And what it hasn't factored in at all is also household efficiency increasing um, over time as well, and that will minimise the actual um, need for this natural resource. I think this is important, and it's great that there has been a lot of community interest in it, because when you're looking at the environmental impact of such a big, big project, um, you need to look at where we want to be, where we need to be in the future, and what are we currently doing now within our current environment, which is um, contributing to global warming. Um, later on, uh, we're talking about, well, it's I don't think no one's withdrawn it, but we're speaking about divestment within our own within our own council policies. So just alone with the lack of consultation, the Renewable Energy Act being inconsistent with that, the Climate Change Act and any um, emission targets, um, I think that the council response is adequate and I fully support this report going forward. And once again, we'd like to thank Councillor Moore for uh, withdrawing this and bringing it to the council table tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Schilling. Um, do I have any other councillors that would like to speak to this item? Uh, Councillor Brown. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Councillors Moore and Schilling. This is a hot topic, and uh, I think it's a bit of an understatement to say there's been a, 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 some community interest in this because it's it's a really hot topic down this particular way. Um, the lack of communication or consultation with landholders is is so extreme that it's it's. I won't say laughable because it's making light of the thing, but it is from a, a professional organisation to not do their consultation adequately is really ridiculous. We've been to a few meetings, Councillor Moore and I, where the community asks questions, but they don't seem to get answers. The community come up with alternatives, which make a lot of common sense, but that seems to be just discarded without taking much notice of. The impact on groundwater is one major impact that seems to be glossed over in this whole debate. The amount of documentation that AGL have provided, the pipeline people have provided, is extreme to say the least. You would have to round your way through it. Instead of asking or answering questions, they just provide documentation. And it's a well-known fact that if you provide enough documentation, that'll soon shut people up when they have to seek out the answers they want. I'm very, very glad that Council is is taking a, a very cautious approach to this situation, and I look forward to seeing what the outcome of it is. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Do I have any other councillors that would like to speak to this item? Uh, there being none, I will go back to Councillor Moore to summarise. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Councillors Brown and Schilling, uh, particularly Michael um, Schilling, for your um, fantastic input into this uh, particular item. I know how passionate you are, as I said before. Um, but this uh, withdrawing this item tonight is really just to provide some awareness. But let's be aware of what's happening around us. Even uh, the, the landowners um, and the farming um, fraternity around, particularly the Cardinia um, area, um, Rithal actually was one of the places that was very, very impacted by this by this situation, um, and they are aware of this. But we want the whole community to understand what 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 we're we're facing in these in these times. Um, this was a um, um, something that was like a foregone conclusion by um, AGL uh, to to just come in and just uh, do this. They had already had the plans all organised, and we're going to just run this through. But so therefore, it's an awareness thing to make sure that all the community know what we're up against um, to battle some of these situations. But one, one of the major things that wasn't being brought up as yet, and that's a, a place called the Ramsar Wetlands of Western Port. This, this is a, a, a project um, that is going to be wholly threatened. Uh, and, and it'll be make this thing environmentally unsafe for years to come, in my opinion. So it's, it's one of those sort of things that that's what uh, this has to go through in this area. And what I'm really doing here tonight is asking our community, our environmental community, our conscientious community who really um, follow these type of things, to submit a submission through the process of the AES. Let's get behind this. Let's, let's help our, our staff here who've, who've set up and really got this organised and um, let's support them and let's put some submission in. And I know it's a big, big document uh, community. Um, this is a very big document to go through and and um, put in a submission, but believe me, it's going to be worthwhile to do. So the, uh, the submissions are going to be in by the 26th of August, which is not very far away, I have to say. But no matter what the issue, if it's a personal one that you can see, that you can highlight, as small as it may be, it's going to make a difference at the end, end of the day. So that's all I ask. Um, that's all I ask for Mr. Mayor, and, um, and I'll leave it at that. But um, thank you for allowing me to withdraw this, because it's very important to us down in particularly the West Support area. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Moore. Um, councillors, I'll now put this to a vote. All, all those in favour? I declare that carried. Thank you. Uh, moving along to item 6.2.2, Regional Local Government Charter, Homelessness and Social Housing, withdrawn by Councillor Schilling. Thank you, Mayor. Tonight, I'd like to move the officer's recommendation that Council endorse the Regional Local Government Charter Homelessness and Social Housing, which represents 13 Eastern and South Eastern Councils and 2 million residents. 
Thank you, Councillor Schilling. And I um, believe Councillor Wilmot would like to second this item. That's correct, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Wilmot. Um, Councillor Schilling, I'll go back to you to uh, speak to this item. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Wilmot, as well, for seconding this um, important item on the agenda tonight. Council uh, has a proud history of supporting those in the community who need it the most. And a great example of that has been some of our social housing projects, which we've all been part of um, during this term of Council. And that's something that I'm very proud of um, during this term of Council. Um, tonight, I'd like to move this charter, which really shows the collective power that local government can have when we all unify for a common cause. The 13 councils involved in this piece of work have all identified homelessness as a huge uh, issue within our community, with a chronic sh uh, shortage of affordable housing contributing to this. This piece of work, this charter that uh, this report proposes we sign up to, is working in partnership with federal and state government, public and private sector and partners to deliver meaningful outcomes for people in southeast Melbourne, scope land within each local government area that has the potential to be repurposed for adaptable housing needs, and also advocating together for inclusive housing growth. Whilst this charter does demonstrate a collective impact, it does align closely with our own social and affordable housing strategy, which this council has also um, adopted. This charter comes from a meeting that was initially held on the 26th of November, 2019, where council CEOs and senior managers across the 13 councils, as I mentioned earlier, have all identified this as a huge issue. An action of this was a regional charter working group, which we're able to facilitate um, through this and keep track of what is happening in this space with the other councils. I would just like to remind everyone and, and residents listening tonight why this piece of work is so important. In Cadinia in 2016, only 0.9% of housing was dedicated to low income families. And according to our research, that means that we have a gap of 2,230 dwellings. Um, so that is two, just over 2,000 dwellings short um, to provide adequate affordable housing for those that need it most, just within our shire. And if you look at the private rental market, there's just, uh, just a handful. Each year there's only a handful, um, some years under five properties that are actually affordable for somebody that uh, require welfare payments. And that's around that 30% mark of an income. Um, and that's and that's absolutely massive. We also have 200 people at any one time sleeping rough in the Shire. That means someone with no fixed address, um, living in a car, couch surfing, or somebody living uh, living on the streets, and um, which is tragic. In terms of some more of our localised data, what is driving homelessness? 39% of people um, due to housing issues. 38% from domestic and family violence. 11% is financial. 4% uh, interpersonal relationships and 2% because of health issues. We do have some fairly significant strategies to address these issues uh, within our council. And one of them in the affordable housing strategy is around the idea that we should be advocating to developers to uh, allocate 2% of their developable, uh, developable land to affordable housing projects. And also not forgetting our partnerships that we've already got with Women's Property Initiative. Um, so the collective impact of this charter um, is to give us the power, really, to advocate for better resources at that state and federal government. Um, so I'd like to recommend this report and hope that my fellow councillors tonight will also join me um, in pushing this through. Thank you. Councillor Schilling. Um, Councillor Wilmer, would you like to speak to this item? Yes, thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Councillor Schilling, for uh, moving this, uh, this item this evening, because it is a very important agenda item. And it plays well into the work that we have already done. And Cadinia Shire can be very proud of the work that we've done over the last um, seven or eight years. Uh, we're well ahead of a lot of other local governments in this space. They're still right at the beginning, whereas we've we've got our strategy, we've adopted that. We have a partnership group that meets on a um, bi-monthly uh, basis. And we're working with those people to um, increase social and affordable housing in our shire. And it's been interesting over the last few meetings of that group um, that we have uh, a number of service providers represented around the table and each and every one of them has commented about this crisis that we're currently in and the impact it will have on our housing um, situation, not only for the, uh, for the homeless and the current homeless, the um, impact that it's going to have on those people that can that lose their jobs 
and can't afford their mortgages, can't afford their rent, and um, the, the need for social housing will be increased at the, as a result of this um, crisis that we're in. And we won't have any idea of what that really looks like until we're well and truly on the other side of this. Um, not knowing how long it's going to go on, the longer it does go on, the greater the impact will be for sure. So I'm really pleased that we're joining with these other 13 councils. And um, I'd like to just acknowledge the work that Monash City um, Council has put into this. They originally commissioned the report and they hosted the initial uh, meeting with the 13 uh, different uh, CEOs from local government. So I, I acknowledge the work that they've already put in in getting this together. And uh, certainly when you're advocating for um, planning policy changes, the, the more local governments that can come together and advocate for those changes, particularly around um, mandating the, the, um, the uh, necessary uh, land to be put aside that developers must do, um, that's, that's not mandated at this point, but it needs to be. It needs to be a requirement of all developers that they put a percentage of their land aside. So the more local governments that band together to advocate for those sorts of changes, the stronger the voice is and the more likely we will have that sort of change implemented. So I'm, I'm very grateful that we are a part of this and I think it plays very nicely into our um, current policies and our livability plan as well acknowledges that there is a shortage of housing. Um, at the affordable level. So I'm very pleased to support this tonight. Thank you. Councillor Wilma. Uh, councillors, do I have anyone else that would like to speak to this item? Councillor Ryan. Thank you through you, Mayor, um, and thank you, Councillor Schilling, um, for a great presentation. Same as uh, Councillor Wilma, um, your input is really good. Um, one of the things, I mean, this is an important issue within our community and we're seeing it worldwide. We're not seeing it just in, in a small community like ours, but in saying that, we are a council for Cadinia Shire and we need to focus on, on trying to um, cut down the risk of people being homeless. Um, I think one of the big factors that I would like to see also in this added is um, we need to aim for women who are 55 and over, who are at risk of homelessness, who are sleeping in their car, and they're the forgotten ones that sometimes they, they slip through the system because they don't have, um, they're, all their children are grown up or, or whatever their, their personal situation is. So we have seen the numbers grow in reference to women of that age, but also with the pandemic, we're seeing men and children that are at risk of homelessness as well with their families. And we need to start looking at those avenues as well. I think all up, we've got to look at every situation and try and improve uh, the conditions and the home um, environment for people within our community and I think uh, Kadinia Shire is is leading the way in doing such a wonderful program and I'm glad that I've been part of this and hope to see more expansion on getting more affordable homes within our community for our residents. Thank you Councillor Ryan. <clears throat> Do I have any other councillors that would like to speak this item, please. Uh, <clears throat> there being none, I'll go back to Councillor Schilling to summarise. Thank you, Mayor, um, and thank you very much, Councillor Wilmot and Councillor Ryan, for um, your contributions to this incredibly important um, report that has come up to Council. Um, I'd just like to conclude by saying that I'm very proud to have been on this Council, and as we are coming to the end of our coming to the end of our term. Um, I think this is something that we can all remember and something that we can all be incredibly proud of, that we've done our little bit, in a sense, to try and make life uh, just a little bit easier for some of our most vulnerable uh, most vulnerable residents. And um, as I've always said, um, we're all fortunate to have a house, a place to call home, but a, a different roll of the dice or a different life circumstance, we could all be um, in a very different situation. So I'd like to thank everybody 
um, who has contributed to our um, social housing um, projects that we have done over the past four years. And I'd also like to thank the officers as well for being part of this fantastic charter. And I really hope, as has already been spoken about, that, um, that we'll be able to get some great outcomes by having that additional collective um, bargaining power, I guess, of the 13 councils. Thank you. Councillor Schilling, well said. Uh, councillors, I'll now put this to a vote. All those in favour, please raise your hand. I declare the item carried. Thank you. Uh, moving along to item 6.2.5, phase four response to COVID-19 impact withdrawn by Councillor Brett Owen. Thank you, Mayor. I move the officer's recommendation detailed and report, please. Uh, my, uh, my apologies all, I, I, I dropped out for a second there. No worries, I'll, I'll go again, Mayor, if that's all right. Um, I, I, moved the, I moved the officer's recommendation in the report. It's a long uh, recommendation. I, won't, I don't intend to uh, read it, but I moved the officer's recommendation. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Councillor Owen. Um, uh, and Councillor Willamont has indicated she would like to second this item. That's correct, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Wilmot. Uh, Councillor Owen, would you like to speak to this item? Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Wilmont. Uh, it's a, a long uh, recommendation and with our time limits, I'm struggling already, so I won't uh, you know, uh, read it out. But uh, basically a summary, uh, the outbreak of coronavirus disease 2019, COVID-19, has created a global health crisis that has had a significant impact on Cardinia Shire's local community groups and businesses. The adverse financial impacts of COVID-19 on community groups using and operating from both council and Crown land facilities uh, without precedent. This report presents information on the impacts of COVID-19 on these uh, community groups for the period of 1st of April to the 30th of September 2020. Unless otherwise stated and recommends initial relief measures to council to consider. So table one, I think it's a really good summary of how council is going to support our uh, community groups that either operate in you know, council-owned land or crown land and also businesses, et cetera. Some it's a really good table and it really summarises it really well about how we propose to help um, the groups. Um, in relation to sporting clubs, and that features quite heavily uh, in this report, is um, you know they've been impacted quite heavily um, from the announcement of the first stage restrictions on Sunday, the twenty second of March, twenty twenty, until Monday, the twenty second of June. Sporting clubs were unable to operate in any capacity. While restrictions were eased on Monday, twenty second of June, to allow for opening of indoor sports venues and resumption of some training and competition under specific conditions, clubs have experienced significant income loss during this period, and it's likely continued. So that is recognised in this support package. Um, and uh, when we get out of this, sporting clubs will be uh, a, a big thing for our community to help us recover. So we need to support, um, you know, there's obviously other groups listed in this report, but sporting groups, particularly for young people and engaging young people again and, and supporting young people by providing that relief, it is so very important because you know, we don't want clubs to go under during this difficult time. So uh, the report does talk about uh, how we support them, whether it's, um, whether it's um, waiver of tenancy, tenancy fees, um, also, provision of financial support towards utility builds, uh, bills and, um, and building and playing surface maintenance. We know that uh, reserves are still being used. Um, that is a permitted, if you're within your five kilometres of exercise, these reserves are still being used. So it's important that we support the clubs and user groups during this period by providing this, this support. There's support for neighbourhood houses, very important. You know, we see that they've had to close their doors, they've lost uh, income, so there's support for them. Senior citizens as well, there's support for our senior citizens group, U3A, 
Um, eligible commercial tenancies. We know there's a, a number of commercial uh, operations yeah, operating from council facilities. We want to support them during this process, so uh, this this crisis. So um, that's all outlined in this package. Uh, the Emerald Museum, uh, Community Hall, Section 86 committees. Um, it's all there. Rate payers, of, of course, further extension to the uh, interest-free period on unpaid rates. Um, in relation to uh, domestic uh, animal owners, there's relief there as well and other eligible businesses. So uh, I encourage um, you know, interested people to read the report. You know, council is committed in supporting our community during this crisis, unprecedented uh, crisis that's before us. Um, you know, and I think this package is there you know, to support our community at this time of need. So thank you very much. I uh, ask other uh, speakers to talk. Thank you. Mm. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor Owen. Um, I'll go to the seconder, Councillor Wilmot, to speak to this item. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Councillor Owen, for withdrawing this item. Um, this is a really uh, great report. It's well, well written, and there's lots and lots of detail in here. Um, and there is lots of detail. Some of our groups that we are supporting, and Councillor Owen has just listed them, the sporting groups, neighbourhood houses, etc. They are going to be vital coming out of this pandemic. They will, they will be the social contacts and the social links that our community will be craving. Um, I'm sure that anybody that plays a team sport will be just dying to get back out there and doing what they, they love to do. Same with our seniors. They're isolated, a lot of them at the moment, and they're not having those usual contacts. And it will be vital for them to get back out there and participating in their clubs, uh, U3As, Again, vital. They've been a little bit lucky. They've been able to do a few things online, a lot of them, but it's it's going to be extremely important that we have those groups still viable in the um, coming out of this pandemic. And our hall committees. These people are volunteers that are running businesses on our behalf, basically. Um, at the moment, they haven't got any income coming in because they can't hold functions and hire out their spaces. But coming out of this, they're going to have increased costs. They're going to have to have increased cleaning uh, in between their, um, their uh, events and their functions. And that's all going to um, put an extra burden on those volunteer committees. Um, our business support, it's great that we can extend some of the uh, support that we had in our first uh, couple of phases of support that we introduced right back in um, April and March. Uh, so back then we um, did adopt that we would give back 25% of the, um, the rule, oh, where is it? The food, the food, um, I've lost it now, sorry. Uh, the Food Act of the, um, for, for the food premises. So we, we were going to give them back 25% of their fees that they pay. Um, we are now going to give them the full 100% back for this year's fees. Um, we've also extended the date for uh, rates for unpaid rates, uh, interest-free, that will be extended now until 31st of March of next year. So that's uh, taking it from October right through to March next year, which is really, really good. Um, and it's it's vital that we do everything we can. There is a limit to how much we can do as a local government, um, and we will be depending heavily on state and federal governments to help um, our residents as much as possible. But it's good that we can do this um, and offer the bits and pieces that we can and I'm sure that people and our businesses will appreciate it and I'm sure that our sporting clubs and our other groups that uh, that maintain our halls and run our clubs etc will be very appreciative of every bit of help that we can help them with and we will continue to advocate on their behalf to the other like uh, to the other government uh, levels so that we can get additional funding for them as well thank you Thank you, Councillor Wilmot. Uh, do I have any other councillors that would like to speak to this item? All right. Thank you, councillors. Uh, there being no other uh, councillors, I'll return to Councillor Owen to summarise. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Wilmot. Um, can I just encourage all residents to check at Council's website? I think we've got a really good um, you know, links to supports and what council is doing in this space. So I encourage uh, residents to have a look at that. It's very vital to, to be informed, you know, informed about how council is helping residents, you know, community groups, sporting groups, etc. So 
this information, you know, obviously in, in time will be uh, presented in, in, in that format as well um, through links, etc. So it is, I'm extremely proud that this council is supporting our community groups during this difficult time. And I reiterate what uh, Council Wilmot says, all these groups will be so important when we get out of this pandemic. Um, and we want to make sure that they're in the financial sort of position to, to, to take the lead and help us, you know, um, have, you know, uh, recover. So thank you, Mayor. I support this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Um, councillors, I'll now put this to a vote. Uh, all those in favour? I declare carried. Thank you. Uh, moving along to item 6.2.6, level crossing removal project, Pakenham and Pakenham station redevelopment, withdrawn by Councillor Schilling. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to move um, the officer's uh, recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Schilling. And I have indication that Councillor Jody Owen would like to second this item. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Uh, Councillor Schilling, I'll now go to you to speak to this item. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the aim of this uh, report, councillors, is to update the community of, of where our level crossing projects are up to and also endorse some key advocacy pieces around the future shape of spaces created by the um, level crossings removal project at Pakenham Station Upgrade. I won't go into it in huge um, detail, but I just want to briefly um, skim over the report and also just um, provide some information of where people can get further information if they would like. Um, as we all know, and um, we can see works uh, definitely taking shape at, at, at Gidinia Road, we know that the projects include the removal of McGregor Road Railway, Main Street, Racecourse Road and Gidinia Road, and we also know that the Pakenham um, station is likely to be an elevated station with three platforms, including a dedicated V-line line track. Um, as I mentioned, um, this is a report just to highlight some of the um, aspects to what will be happening with these projects. And what we're asking tonight for Council is to endorse that Council officers work towards um, advocating for improvements to support enhanced opportunities for existing and future businesses within the project sites, um, integration of train stations, bus exchange and car parking uh, with the town centre and surrounding communities, including improved pedestrian connections. And that's a very important one when we're talking about increased density within activity centres, provision of safe, functional and maintainable community spaces, improvement of amenity and of the areas, including landscaping throughout the precincts, also provision of improved traffic circulation, including new pedestrian and bicycle connections. And finally, the minimal disruption to local business and wider community during destruction, uh, destruction I shouldn't say that, construction. Um, so I guess irrespective of people's views on, on this project, we really do have a great opportunity to make sure and advocate to the state government that we get the scope of this project right. So it can serve the community for years to come. Um, we need this project to be part of creating a happy, healthy and, and vibrant local communities um, across these um, sites. And we need to really keep in mind that we are likely to continue experiencing unprecedented growth. Um, that will happen right across our shire. So we need to make sure that our advocacy isn't just fit for how we see our community today in five years time, but how we see it in 10, 20 years time, particularly at the completion of the uh, Pakenham structure plan um, the full implementation of, of, of that report as well. So what we hope to see is that some terrific community spaces will emerge from these projects. Only a few years ago, and probably at the beginning of this council, people uh, were commenting on open spaces under Sky Rail in Europe and other places around the world. Now you don't have to go much further than down the Pakenham line to see some of the amazing open space um, and how it's been transformed into functional and exciting places for people to meet and to um, and, and to enjoy. And um, once again, as I as I mentioned earlier, this will only become more and more important as our centres do build up. Um, so to make sure council does its bit, there's been a governance group which has been formed, uh, which will ensure that we are able to be on point. And as an organisation, we can sort of provide that consistent messaging to the project to make sure that we're able to advocate for um, getting the most out of this project. So the yeah, mission of um, withdrawing this tonight was really just to give council um, and the community a little bit of an update and just inform the community on some of the advocacy that is actually happening behind the scenes. Thank you.
Thank you, Councillor Schilling. Um, I'll go to Councillor Jody Owen to speak to this item. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as a central ward councillor, it has been evident ever since I joined council in 2012 that residents have been absolutely screaming for something to be done about, especially about McGregor Road. So residents were a little dismayed when the state government did Cadenia Road first, but we can now see that this is of a bigger scheme and it's fantastic to see that what Councillor Schilling is talking about tonight is about McGregor Road, also about Main Street and um, looking at the Pakenham Station, which although Council has spent a lot of money and a lot of time developing Burke Park, we still have issues down there. So hoping residents will get on board with the groups that the government has set up to get advice so that all residents have their wishes taken into account. But I'm really excited that finally um, Pakenham residents will have some ease from the congestion we have, especially around McGregor Road and, and as we're already seeing with Cadinia Road when it's completed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Um, do I have any other councillors that would like to speak to this item? Uh, Councillor Ross. Councillor Ross, I believe your mic's still on mute. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, I've heard councillors talk about hot topic. There is no hotter topic in Pakenham uh, that's been over the last 15 or 20 years. When I uh, started advocating uh, to run for council in 2006, uh, before the 2008 election, I rang over 7,000 people and asked them, what are the top topics that you've got in Pakenham? Number one was the rate increases that they said were excessive. Number two was Cardinia Road crossing. Uh, sorry, McGregor Road crossing, they said was absolutely number two. Now, I, I spoke to 7,000 people and got comments. No one's ever done a survey like that. They said this was the number one project that they wanted done after rate increases. And I must say, this issue has gone on for over 20 years. Over 20 years, we've had successive governments or representatives until the last state election actually fund the crossing. And, and I must say, in my time, uh, when I was mayor in 1718, I met with the Minister for Transport three times. She came down here, we walked through the crossings, all four of them, and the Pakenham train station. She had a look, she came back to the council offices, we showed her the detail around this that needed to be done. And if you want to look at the statistics, that, Pakenham, that McGregor Road crossing was designed for 750 cars a day. It has almost 14,000 vehicle movements every single day. It is the hottest topic. I tell you, I sit there at least four times a day waiting to go across. And when you look at this issue, this is one of the biggest, big elephants in the room. And I can tell you, over the years, other than rate increases and this, the third issue would be that far distant, it's at a long way back. I must say, this is fantastic. Uh, to see something done and on all four of the crossings. If you look down the other end of Main Street and Cooey Rut Road, the amount of housing that's gone in in the Pakenham North area is absolutely huge. Tens of thousands of people have moved up there and that crossing down there hasn't changed at all either. So these are absolutely needed. I support this motion. I know all of Pakenham will. I must say, and anyone who's walked through the train station at Pakenham would have known it had needed a renovation 10 years ago. In fact, it got agreed to get a renovation done before the second train station was built on Cardinia Road, except they only allocate so much money for things. So they did the building of the station down at Cardinia Road and they had to put it on hold, the Pakenham train station. Well, I must say, this is infrastructure that's urgently needed. The population has boomed and boomed and boomed and we need to have a state-of-the-art station. We need those crossings to be gone so people can drive around instead of wasting time. And I must say, it will it will reduce the dangerous level across some of these crossings where people get impatient because they've sat there for a long, long time. They watch trains shunting up and down, up and down, up and down. Sometimes they're going past at about one mile an hour. It's unbelievable. So I welcome this. I look forward to it. I must say it's funded and we're just waiting for it all to happen. Cardinia Road's happening now. And I can't wait. I urge my fellow councillors to support this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Ross. Do I have any other councillors who would like to? Councillor Ryan. Oh, am I unmuted? 
can you hear me thank you <laughs> it didn't show up um yes i'm in support of this thank you very much for the presentation and um as the four of us central ward councillors we've been advocating strongly with our residents um and anyone else that we can put it out there that this is a long time coming and it is badly needed and to see that some of the positive things that will come from this is that a lot of people think that the sky rail might be a problem but i see it as a really productive identity because with our crossings gone and sky rail um, hopefully happening the benefits are that you'll have a better traffic flow especially for emergency services at the moment emergency services could be waiting up to 15 minutes on McGregor Road and Racecourse Road to get across, which is really could be someone's life. Um, so besides that, there would be less accidents. It would also create um, better crossing for, for our pedestrians, a safer environment for them. And it will create the opportunity to create some beautiful open space there that can be utilised with gardens, um, in whatever your imagination wants to be. Um, I think um, to me, yeah, being here so long and seeing that our station has been the same since oh, 1979 and probably before that, nothing has changed with that station. So I think with the crossing and everything, I think with our central ward councillors, we all agree that this is a long time coming and it needs to be done. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Ryan. Uh, do I have any other councillors that would like to speak to this item, please? Councillor Brett Owen. Thank you, Mayor, and thanks every uh, other councillor for speaking. Um, I constantly get re a resident uh, text me photos of them waiting at the railway crossing at McGregor Road. Um, you know, random messages, guess where I am? Waiting at the crossing. And I tend to agree. Um, this is such a really important project. Packenham is very constrained by these three intersections, very constrained. And as the previous speaker said, I see just nothing but positives, pedestrian links, vehicular links. Back in 2012, uh, when I was mayor 13, uh, council you know, was then speaking to the government in regarding the increased train movements. Now we're, we've got the stabling yard uh, between Pakenham and, uh, Pakenham and Nanagoon. The train movements has increased so much and will continue um, as that facility continues to roll out. So through the advocacy, we've been able to bring forward these, intersect, inter, uh, these railway crossing removals because of what these, um, the research was saying that if these crossings weren't removed it would be absolute deadlock in Pakenham. So I'm really pleased that it has been brought forward to the original timelines and works have started already in relation to the design but there's great benefits as said by other councillors. The parks underneath um, I've seen you know off-leash dog parks and other areas, great pedestrian links. It's just it will open it up because at the moment Pakenham is so uh, constrained and it will provide so much commercial opportunities, new road linkages. So um, I commend um, the council in its advocacy and obviously a number of councillors have played in that over many years. So thank you to that effort and officers and, and the CEOs in the time in, in, in the past. So uh, this is great news and we'll continue to work with the with the government for a, for a fantastic outcome. And this is not the end of it. We need further railway crossing removals throughout our shire. You know, look at Beaconsfield, there's a lot of, um, once again, issues around uh, the railway station and pedestrian connections and, and uh, you know, we, we need to continue our advocacy. Council, in relation to McGregor Road, Council's done its bit. We, we've done we've done the duplication of the, of, of the roads and, and the crossing was the barrier. And people said, why did you make it go into one again and then out? You know, we, we don't have control of the crossing. The government does. They need to fund the millions of dollars to, to, to remove it. So we're really pleased that this is moving forward. It's a great uh, result for our community. So thank you, Matt. 
Thank you, Councillor <coughs> Owen. Um, do I have any other councillors that would like to speak to this item? Uh, there being none, I'll go back to Councillor Schilling to summarise. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mayor, and, and thank you, councillors, for 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 the um, the input. Um, yes, I, I I agree. It's um, it's a very exciting outcome uh, for the community and for people wanting to find out more. Um, the levelcrossings.vic.gov.au um, is a fantastic source of information. Um, information is all accurate, up to date, um, and they also have a fantastic a lot of community consultation that happens. I know. Or maybe not so much now with um, uh, COVID restrictions, but I know pre-COVID there were community tents set up down at the stations to inform residents. So get on, get onto that website, and I know that the crew um, managing the project are incredibly responsive and are happy to get as much community feedback as possible. So um, look, it's, it's it's a fantastic project for the community, and I, I certainly look forward to seeing the projects um, coming on board for what it will mean for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Schilling. Uh, we'll now put this to a vote. Councillors, all those in favour? I declare carried. Thank you, Councillors. Moving along to item 6.3.1, 2020 Local Government Act policies, withdrawn by Councillor Wilmot. Thank you, Mayor. I move the recommendation that Council 1 adopts the following policies and rules required to be in place by September 1 in accordance with the Local Government Act 2020, being the governance rules, councillor expenses policy, and the transparency, uh, sorry, the public transparency policy, and to revoke the policy adopted by council on the 11th of November 2013 regarding the election of the deputy mayor. I get a second or I'll speak to that. Thank you, Councillor Wilmot. Um, I have indication that Councillor Schilling would like to second this item. Yes, happy to, Mayor. Thank you. I'll go back to Councillor Wilmot to speak to this item. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Schilling. Um, councillors, as you know, the Local Government Act uh, 2020 was uh, brought in a couple of months ago, and there is a process that we will be going through to um, make changes and to adopt some new policies and procedures and some rules. And uh, these are just three of what will be um, part of a staged process. Um, so tonight we've, we've got the governance rules, which did go out to public consultation for a four week period. Uh, and it was mainly via the website, of course, being at the moment, but it was also advertised in the Gazette. Um, there were 66 views on our website of the, the, um, the governance rules but only one, one comment or submission was made, um, and that was regarding um, attendance at meetings, and that's covered um, within the policy. So uh, I think the person who, who put in that comment. Um, the other policies, the councillor expenses and the transparency policy didn't have to go out to uh, public consultation, but they are equally important. Um, the governance rules, of course, is primarily about how we conduct our meetings. Uh, it also covers off uh, the election period um, as well as conflicts of interest. But the main change in this policy, in this uh, document, is around the election of the deputy mayor. Previously, it was pretty much a given thing that it would go to whoever was coming out of the year as mayor would then become the uh, deputy mayor, and that was this as fraught role for a new mayor. Uh, the policy is now going to change and it will be open to whoever wants to nominate. Um, so that's a bit of a change there. That's the main one. There's been a little bit of tidying up, but that's the main one. The councillor's expenses policy. Again, a lot of that was just a little bit of tidying up. Some of it was not relevant really anymore, um, but there have been a few things included, particularly around the claim forms. There's some new information. Um, the forms have been redesigned so that that information can be held in the forms. Um, and the out-of-pocket expenses claim has also been updated to include some more information. And it's all clear on the forms. It, all, it says exactly what you've got to put in there. Um, and these policies are there as a, as a form of protection for councillors. If councillors provide the information that's required on these forms, and follows the procedures as outlined in this, in this policy, then they are providing the transparency that's needed 
and it eliminates the need to um, ask further questions because the information is there. So you're protecting yourself. The more information you give, the less scrutiny there will be at the other end of it. Um, the transparency policy. That's about how council will make their information available to the public. Um, so that's about you know how we make our um, meeting minutes and so forth available, um, any of our documentations and so forth. And council has adopted the um, or the draft that's before us for adoption is following the um, the best practice guidelines as um, set by the uh, state government. So um, I won't waffle on about it too much because this is all pretty straightforward. There's not a big lot of differences. I will just mention though, sorry, I should have earlier, in the expenses policy, there is clarification about where a trip should start from. I know this was a concern for some councillors who work, whether or not uh, if they're leaving work to come to a council meeting, does the trip start at their work or at their home? And um, that has been changed so that uh, council claims um, if the travel commences from an alternative location such as council or workplace, the distance that is entitled to be claimed shall be the lesser distance. So if you work in Hawthorne and you're travelling from Hawthorne, no, that doesn't cut the mustard. You'll claim from home to council um, because that will be, of course, the shorter distance. Um, so that's been clarified in there as well. So they're good policies. They've been tidied up. They're a lot clearer than what they were, and I hope that uh, you will all support their adoption. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilmot. I'll go to Councillor Schilling to speak to this item. Thank you, man. Thank you, Councillor Wilmot, for uh, moving these. I know that um, uh, these um, policies have been something that you have um, spent uh, a lot of time looking over, and um, your attention to detail um, is is fantastic. Um, look, these policies are really about good governance, good governance policy, and making sure that we have optimal transparency to the community as well, and we've got processes. Um, in place to make sure that we're transparent and to make sure that as a council we're able to function to the highest possible standard. Um, I understand the Local Government Act and local government policies probably aren't um, interesting to um, a lot of people, um, but it is important that we do have them in the background and when we do get this opportunity to review the policy, um, it's important that we um, do so and we make necessary changes um, as we see fit. And I think that um, Obviously, the implementation of the new Local Government Act has paved the way perfectly for this and um, the local government, um, these new rules, I think, will set the future council, the next council, um, in, good, in good stead. Um, they're also great reference documents for councillors. Um, we know that um, in terms of even meeting procedure um, and how we conduct ourselves in meetings and what the rules are in public meetings, um, it's a great reference guide um, as well. And um, yeah, I hope that everyone supports them as well um, tonight. And thank you to the governance team for um, putting them together. It's, it's quite a big, big series of documents. And um, obviously, they've probably been put together um, quite quickly given the Local Government Act implementation. So thank you very much. And I hope um, everyone supports them tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Schilling. Um, do I have any councillors that would like to speak to this item? All right, uh, Councillor Brett Owen. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you to the other councillors. Um, you've covered it very well. I just want to talk about the the travel. I, I was one of the councillors that wanted a clarification on that. Um, my opinion should you know, was that you know if you're coming from work from a further distance, it should be you know, from your home, as if you're going from home, which is the shorter distance. So I've been uh, really pleased that this uh, policy uh, does cover that. Um, and also the election of the, the deputy mayor, I know that's been talked about, but, um, you know, we're back in, I think, 2013, council decided to elect a deputy mayor, and at the time it was the thought that, uh, it, you know, that role would provide, you know, a, a supportive role, mentoring type um, role uh, for the incoming mayor. And I've changed my view on this. I think uh, the deputy role uh, can be a, a, a position that can develop a councillor, you know, uh, prepare a councillor for for the next uh, next step uh, of being mayor. So, I support that, and and it should be on merits as well. Um, 
so I support those changes as well, and and we'll obviously go to an election you know, that anyone can nominate for as well. So thank you. That's all. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Um, any other councillors like to speak to this item? Uh, they're being done. I'll go back to um, Councillor Wilmot to summarise. Thank you, Mayor. I'm not sure that I have anything further to add. I think it's all been covered off between the three of us, but um, I think um, the work that the government's team has put into this is great. We have discussed these policies a couple of times at briefing sessions, so nothing in here should be a surprise to councillors, and uh, I hope you will all support these policies. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilmot. Um, councillors, uh, we'll now put this to a vote. All those in favour, please raise your hands. I declare that carried. Thank you, councillors. Uh, moving along to item 6.4.1, contract 20-23, Comley Banks, Recreation Reserve Civil Construction, withdrawn by Councillor Brett Owen. Thank you, Mayor. I move a, a slight amended motion to what's in the officer's recommendation. Uh, I move the following. The tender submitted by to Evergreen Turf Group for $7,607,779.08, excluding GST, excluding the bowling green construction, be accepted by Council for the contract 20 to 23 Comley Banks Recreation Reserve Civil Works. Two, the remaining tenderers be advised accordingly. And three, Council execute the contract documents. I move so. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Um, and I've been indicated that Councillor Brown would like to second this motion. That is correct, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Um, back to you, Councillor Owen, to speak to this item. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Brown. It is amended because um, point two of the original paperwork uh, was talking about the bowling green construction, depending on the, the grant application that Council submitted. Uh, today, uh, councillors were advised that uh, Council was uh, unsuccessful in relation to the state government community sports infrastructure COVID stimulus program, um, in which we apply for a grant to construct the, uh, the bowling green. So it was unsuccessful. So today we're considering the tender in, in the in the thought that that is not included. So, uh, so the proposed multi-use uh, four rectangular pitches, rugby union, and other other um, rectangular sports uh, fields, um, cricket, bowling, playing facilities are located at Comley Banks Reserve and Bridge Road Officer. Comley Banks will be one of a number of community sporting facilities being planned within the southeast growth area. Uh, significant population growth, as we know. And the arrival of several families per day in the Shire continue to increase the demand for accessible, multi-use and well-designed community infrastructure. Um, so, so the works is um, four rectangular pitches for rugby union and league, but they are multi-use fields. And basically any rectangular sport, even AFL can go on these multi-use fields. And I think that is really important because sporting you know, sporting, um, you know, needs change from time to time. And uh, to build these these fields in a uh, flexible way is really important. So there, there will be capacity to play AFL if required, but we know that we've got a lack of rectangular type um, fields in, in Cardinia, and this will provide that focus, but it has a multi-use element, which is really important. There's obviously a car park and driveways uh, construction of this. This uh, facility is a regional type facility. It has a wide uh, sort of uh, catchment of use. It, it um, it's next to the primary school next door, Bridgewood, and um, you know uh, there's car parking. You know that will obviously be created that will benefit the school community, and, and I think that's a good thing. If if we've got multiple users of these facilities, I think that provides that that uh, that great uh, wider community benefit. So that's part of that as well. There's um, a multi-use training facility that's uh, like um, the the cricket nets, but it also can be accommodated for other sports that use use the the facility so this 
uh, contract is funded over two uh, financial periods, this current budget and the next uh, budget. So it's spread over uh, two uh, financial years. Uh, so that spreads the loads. Um, so this is all outlined in the master plan for the reserve. So we're achieving the master plan uh, as, as it was adopted. Um, council has, uh, obviously this, this um, facility is next to the primary school. There's no user group um, sort of um, uh, agreements in place. So if the school would, would like to use some of these facilities, there needs to be ongoing conversations uh, with council to, to, to work out what that would look like. So, but uh, this is fantastic. You know, council is providing these great facilities for our community, particularly for our young people. As we get out of this COVID-19, um, these facilities will be well utilised and, and bring the community together. So I, I support so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Um, Councillor Brown, would you like to speak to this item? Yeah, thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you, Councillor Owen, for that very accurate summing up. There's not much more I can add to that except to say that uh, to have multi-use ovals, rectangular or the like, um, can do nothing but good. But you can use them for a multitude of sports, and I do notice that there are going to be cricket played at this establishment. There is already the club rooms in place. All we need is the people to use them and also the, uh, the playing grounds. Rugby union, I guess, is a growing sport. I see it out at Cardinia often. And I think that to provide something like that in the middle of uh, office or in the middle of Cardinia is going to be a great asset to that particular sport. I look forward to going and having a look at it because I used to look at a, a bit of it in New South Wales and I must say I enjoyed it. The bowling club is, um, is on the agenda and uh, that I don't know whether that will be welcomed by the Packenham Bowling Club, who who, um, who have a lot of members, but they're always looking for new members, and I don't know whether or not they'll be pleased to see another bowling green positioned um, at Cumley Banks, but it's far enough away, and it'll suit the officer and the people around that particular area. Uh, and the bowling green's probably a little way off when we get some additional funding for that um, that, that asset. But all in all, I think it's um, it's going to be a great facility for this end of the Shire or the middle of the Shire, I should say, in Officer, and the primary school nearby will benefit from it, I'm sure. So I, I fully support it, Mayor, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Um, do I have any other councillors that would like to speak to this item? Councillor Ross. Mutes off. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, look, I must say this facility is going to be an absolutely superb facility. Um, over, over the uh, time, the, the newly established club, which has only been going a few years, the Pakenham Eels Rugby League Club, uh, do an amazing job to, to promote different, a different sport with inside our shire for the growing community. I must say I've been to lots of games, I've been to finals, and I've even been to grand finals where they won their very first premiership with a junior women's team. Uh, it was absolutely amazing. They are such a close-knit club. They've literally got hundreds of members who play seniors, juniors, men's and women's um, rugby league. And in summertime, they even have pushing a 1,000 people who play touch rugby for their club. So this is well away, um, well needed. Um, I've seen them. They, they play their touch rugby at the moment at the y IYU. Um, soccer facility, um, working in with the soccer group that's there. They play most of their rugby league games at Cardinia Reservoir and to have a, a home base in Pakenham that is an absolutely first class facility for them will be so well utilised and well used. Uh, it is noted too that other groups will come to use that area, such as Rugby Union, where we don't have any teams at the moment, uh, more cricket pitches, which is excellent, and another bowling club eventually down there. But anyway, I just think this is wonderful. You're going to see some really, really happy faces from the Pakenham Eels Rugby League Club. They're a wonderful club. They're so close-knit. And for those, those, particularly the young people who play, um, to find another activity that is outside of the other activities that they would normally do 
and to see them go along. And, and one of the nights I went to the grand final, it absolutely teamed rain all night. If you reckon they weren't the most passionate supporters, they stood out in the rain, it was freezing cold, and they loved every single minute of it. So I, I can't wait to see this develop. I think it's a wonderful investment and I can't look forward. I hope my fellow councillors will support this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Russ. <laughs> Do I have any other councillors that would like to speak to this item? <clears throat> uh, there being none, I'll go back to Councillor Brett Owen to um, summarise. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, councillors. Um, today I had a, a separate meeting with officers regarding this project because I had a number of questions and uh, um, I asked a lot of questions about the tender and, and, the, and and, and why the officers recommended Evergreen. And uh, I am, after those serious questions I had with them uh, over a number of issues, I'm, I'm confident now that Evergreen, uh, as, as in the officers' recommendation, is the preferred uh, tenderer which we're proposing to accept. Tenders were evaluated against the criteria of compliance with the specification financial viability, risk, and insurance, compliance to conditions of contract, conflict of interest, OHS quality systems, quality of previous work, project plan, pricing and value for money, compliance with the specifications, capability, relevant experience and past performance of the tenderer. And Evergreen um, has done some work for council, most recently Worrell Reserve, and that's a fantastic outcome at, at Worrell Reserve in, in Emerald. Um, it is a local uh, company, but it wasn't just that while we're um, nominating this as the preferred tenderer. The, the other reasons, as I outlined before, about the, uh, the the assessment of the tender, which is really important. We need to think about all those issues when we're um, awarding a tender. And I believe speaking with officers, we'll continue to, as we go through this contract and this project, we'll be seeking you know, ways to further save money in relation to the delivery of this project. And there is there is possibilities and there's real um, chances of, of reducing the cost further with uh, working with the contractor to find those savings. So I just wanted to say that. In relation to the bowling club, you know, it's amazing, Councillor Brown. Um, you know, there is strong interest for a bowling club in office. I'm getting emails the last, recent, the last few days that because of the population is growing, and, um, there is a need for another bowling club. At the moment, it is not now because we didn't get that grant but in the future council will consider you know obviously applying for further grants because the master plan has the the bowling club and we know it's not just for seniors we know bowling is a popular sport across all ages so i think that's that's really good that we can achieve that so and i, I do like the uh the multi-use um, part of this this facility um it's not just the, the rectangular it can be afl depends on the needs of our community and and this will be an overflow. We're, we're upgrading reserves across the Shire as well. And you know, if the, if other clubs need to go there for the interim, um, while their their oval is being upgraded, that will be an overflow as well. So I support this project. It, it's positive news for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, uh, Councillors, I'll now put that to a vote. All those in favour, please raise your hand. I declare the item carried. Thank you. Uh, moving along to item 6.4.2, contract 20 slash 31 and 20 slash 32, Kui Rup football and cricket change rooms and Kui Rup netball pavilion, uh, withdrawn by Councillor Brown. Uh, Councillor Brown, you have an alter alternative motion to move for this item. I do, Mayor. Please. When I find it. Am I in the air? Yes, yes. The council award the tender submitted by Two Construct Proprietary Limited for contract 20 31, Kui Rup Football and Cricket Change Rooms for the amount of $1,892,929, which includes the additional spectator shelter at a cost of $69,638 and completion of the community room at a cost of $12,831. Dollars, acknowledging that the Curry Up Football and Cricket Clubs have agreed to reimburse the cost of the completion of the community room component and, number two, award the tender submitted by two Construct Pride Limited 
the contract 2032 Kurap Netball Pavilion for the amount of $1,088 and, and uh, $1,088,000 and 800, $880,009 and advise all tenders accordingly and execute the contract documents. Thank you, Councillor <laughs> Brown. Um, I have indication that Councillor Ross would like to second that item. That's a wave of the hand. Thank you, Councillor Ross. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I'll go back to Councillor Brown to speak to this item. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in all the doom and gloom of COVID-19, the loss of the football season, the loss or expected loss of the cricket season, there is a deal of excitement in Kuirup, and that is with the proposed building of these change rooms to replace the existing rooms, which are some 55 plus years of age and um, have been kept in good condition, mainly through the good work of the uh, Committee of Management and the user groups, and also Cadinia Shire with the Community Capital Works grants, which were used extensively. I'd like to acknowledge the work of the officers, Walter and Christian, in the negotiations with the user groups in respect of these change rooms because obviously we have to adhere to standards and the current rooms were oversized in some areas, undersized in others. And with a bit of balancing, we were able to get, or well, they were able to get agreement with the users as to the required outcome. And the outcome is just fantastic. During the the um, consultation, the architect there, there was an opportunity there um, under the roof line to include an additional room. This was put to the users, but it was pointed out to them that it would be outside the scope or the conditions of the facilities that if they required that, they would have to pay for it. And initially they rejected that. But one of the ladies at one of these meetings, she's indicated that it would be a great use for a creche type of thing which we currently do or the club currently does in the social rooms. They barricade off a corner of the social rooms and they set up a creche for the young children who play in the social rooms. Uh, this becomes a problem because when the bar opens, they get turfed out and they've got nowhere to go. So she was very, very um, strong on the fact that if we've got an opportunity to have this community room, for want of a better word, why don't we do it even though we've got to pay for it? So I sat down with the clubs and they agreed to pay for this particular room, which I think is a good outcome. What's included in the change rooms is um, um, they've got, we'll have um, female, female friendly stand and universally accessible amenities, umpire amenities, a gym and first aid room. And it also includes a new netball pavilion which provides social space, change amenities, umpires amenities, canteen, first aid storage and an office, all of which meet the facility standards. That was a greenfield start there. There was no problems. The issue that came up and would not go away was the spectator shelter. Currently, Tuirup Recreation Reserve has 230 square metres of spectator shelter and the standard is 90 square metres. The shelter is, is very, very well used and it's a characteristic of the Futura football ground and anybody that's been there when there's been a big match there on there would see that you can hardly move under that shelter. So to compress the people into 90 square metres, I think is drawing a long bow. And as well as um, social um, separation, I would say emotional separation comes into the fact as well, because each end of the pavilion, which the shelter runs the full length of, are the opposing team's change rooms. So if they're far enough apart, it makes for a much more comfortable Saturday afternoon. Also that spectator shelter provides, provides a link between the social rooms and the canteen, where you can move from the social rooms to the canteen undercover. Uh, which is a, uh, an absolute asset on particularly uh, rainy, cold, wet, windy days. So it's it's something that the clubs are very, very strong on. It's something they really want to retain. And even with the additional space proposed in this motion, 
they're still going to finish up around about 50 square metres short, but they can wear, they can wear that, I think. Um, as I said before, with large crowds, the space gets full. People, people like to be able to get out of their cars, and if we're going to reduce that spectator area, they won't be able to get out of their cars. Of particular importance is the fact that incorporated in this pavilion, the football and cricket pavilion, are public toilets, new public toilets, which will replace the outdated, always broken, always dirty, except for football and cricket mornings when the clubs clean them, public toilets, which will be the greatest asset that we can possibly have at, at this particular ground. So I just hope that councillors see fit to, to um, support this motion and uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor <coughs> I will go to Councillor Ross to speak to this item next. I reserve my right to speak in a minute. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Ross. Uh, would any other councillors like to speak to this item? Uh, Councillor Moore. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for allowing me to speak just one moment. I know that uh, Councillor Brown's a very humble man, and uh, I just want to congratulate uh, him uh, for his negotiating skills. Uh, working with the staff, uh, with the clubs, with the cricket club, the football club, uh, um, the netball club of Kurup. Um, what a fantastic result! And I, I must commend um, him for for what he's done to, for his own township there, particularly of Kurup, uh, for getting this. Hopefully, and I, I hope that, that we we get together as a, a community of councils here tonight to uh, to vote this through because I think it's a great result. Uh, for a great club and a, and a, um, a community that's that's growing hourly uh, in the Cooler Up area, and and I think um, it's well deserved to see these um, facilities um, come to fruition. But um, well done, Councillor Brown. Uh, you're doing a really great job there, um, connecting the community together with with our with our council staff. And I, I just wanted to say that um, from myself. But uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Moore. Um, are there any other councillors that would like to speak to this item? <clears throat> All right. Um, there be none. I'll see if Councillor Ross would like to go back to speak to this item next again. Thank you. I would thank you, Mr. Mayor. Look, uh, the thing that caught my eye in this amendment was the fact that um, when we spend so much money and we go to upgrade facilities, what we should be looking to do is to improve the whole aesthetics of the facility. And when Councillor Brown spoke to me about the amendment, he spoke about the out, outside viewing area, the fact that they had 200 square metres and it was going to be reduced to 90. Uh, in, in building and spending the millions of dollars we spend on these facilities, we should be looking to improve these facilities or at least keep the facilities at no worse off than what they were. So I see this in um, him coming to a resolution with the club that they would be happy with an outdoor area being slightly smaller, but relative to what they had before is just part of improving the whole facility. Um, and that's that's our job is to try and improve the whole facility, not to have parts of it that are good and parts of it aren't. Anyway, I hope my fellow councillors support this. I, I commend Councillor Brown for his hard work on this, trying to get a resolution with all parties concerned. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Ross. Um, I'll now go back to Councillor Brown to summarise. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Councillors Moore and Councillors Ross. I appreciate your comments. Um, there was 18 contractors provided tender submissions for this project. They were checked against a range of non-weighted criteria to ensure the viability of the relevant submissions. The criteria comprise the financial viability, insurances, conditions of contract, conflict of interest, and OHS. Tenders were also assessed against weighted criteria such as compliance with the specification, capability, relevant experience and performance, project program, and quality system. Uh, a detailed assessment of the submitted tenders was completed by the evaluation panel with the tenders by two constructor prior limit providing best value for money outcomes. Um, I do agree with Councillor Ross that we should 
enhance our facilities rather than take things away where we don't have to, just to comply with standards. I think if we leave users with less than what they had beforehand, I don't think it's a good result. And I don't think it stands council in good stead where potentially we could have hundred, hundreds of people, I, I don't say that lightly, uh, congregating under a 90 square metre section of spectator coverage. It's interesting to note that even by, by um, paying for the outdoor spectac spectator cover, getting a bit tongue-tied here, uh, the budget was the the project will still be seventy five thousand dollars under budget. So it's under budget. It's not costing any more money to provide this extra cover. And I urge councillors to please support this motion. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor <coughs> Brown. Um, councillors, I'll now put this to a vote. All, all those in favour, please raise your hand. I declare the item carried. Thank you, councillors. Uh, moving along to um, item 6.5.3, major projects report withdrawn by Councillor Brett Owen. Thank you, Mayor. I move that the uh, report be noted. Thank you, Councillor Owen. And um, I believe Councillor Moore would like to second this item. I'll proudly second it, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Moore. Um, I'll go back to Councillor Brett Owen to talk to this item. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Moore. As part of the reporting process to Council, this monthly report provides an update of the status of major projects in progress. It includes an update on major projects, capital works, special charge schemes and asset management uh, current at the time of this report. So as all councillors you know, like to do sometimes, we like to promote these um, uh, progress of these uh, items. So the Beacon Hill Recreation Reserve, um, that project is the... Uh, renovation, the improvement of the change rooms that were built in uh, the early 80s. That is uh, not in keeping with uh, people's expectations uh, for, for female friendly and universal design. So so that project, the tender is about to be announced and, and works uh, uh, occur soon. In relation to the Upper Beaconsfield Recreation Reserve, um, that is the redevelopment of, the, of new accessible change room facilities, including amenities for umpire room, store and associated earthworks, and also a public toilet aspect. Um, Council did apply for further uh, grants through the Victorian government um, to, to do more in that space in relation to the facilities at the reserve, but unfortunately, uh, on Friday, Council were advised that we were unsuccessful of that grant. So that being known now, we will go back uh, to the uh, steering group, uh, the user groups to, to design the change room elements uh, for that reserve. So uh, we only found out that um, on Friday, which is unfortunate because um, uh, that means that we'll have to you know, do a stage type development there, but at least the change rooms element for the reserve is on, on, on target. Um, I just wanted to talk about some others. Uh, Connect Cardinia Stage 2. So this is our roads program. You know, work is continuing in that space and, and the report really details the progress. We've got a really good website uh, link that talks about um, uh, the status updates of, of all these roads. But these are the upgrade of roads, uh, um, McGregor Road, Hobson's Road, um, Thulis Road, Armitage Road, LL Road, which is a, a very important link uh, coming from the Green Wedge to the Growth Corridor. It's a bit of a rat run at the moment, so that's on track. Um, Huxville Road, Door Road, Bessie Creek Road. So, so uh, Council is progressing with the designs and, and about to go to tender for those, those roads. Kenilworth Avenue is 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 coming to the close of finalisation. I know that it's caused a lot of pain, and you know I'm one of them that uh, is, um, but we're we're getting there, and hopefully in the coming months uh, that uh, Kenilworth Avenue um, east west link from uh, Pakenham, uh, sorry Beacon Seal to Officer will be finally finalised. Um, the Princess Highway intersection upgrades is progressing and great news about O'Neill Road. Council has engaged a, a, a tenderer for that. 
we're just waiting on the final approvals from the Department of Transport. I'm very keen to, to, to really celebrate that and, and get works going, but we're just waiting on those final approvals from DOT, DA, DOT um, Department of Transport. So um, Lisbon Roads are not far off that. Um, in relation to our playground upgrades, I love our playground upgrades. And um, at the moment, we're planning for the playground upgrade at Redwood Road, Jembrook, Kath Roberts Reserve in Beaconsfield, and Keith Ewanson uh, Reserve in Upper Beaconsfield. So those three playgrounds are on our website um, through Have Your Say. We want to get feedback from residents and families about what sort of equipment they want in those playground renewals. So please do that. You know, it's a really good quick survey where you can nominate the sort of elements you want in that playground. So please, uh, for, for residents to really partake in that because, you know, these playground uh, upgrades are really important for families. They renew older playgrounds and, and, and give them a new life. So I just want to provide that update. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah. I'll um, go to Councillor Moore to speak to this item next. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, so this is what we call a progress um, report, our major, major projects. It's fantastic. The, um, the biggest thing at the moment is because the list isn't as productive or extensive as it would normally have been with the, with the, um, because of the uh, COVID-19. Uh, um, of course, uh, we don't have as many um, uh, projects actually on the books at the moment, but I would like to highlight a couple. And one, one in particular is the, the Bunyip Soccer Reserve. It's, it's, it's got uh, two new soccer pitches um, in design at the moment. Uh, so it'll, it'll be enhancing with the with the um, pavilion that's up there at the moment, which is just fantastic, the pavilion there. And as we were talking about before about reserves, let's do the whole job. Let's not just do it half. Let's take it all, all away. So with the, the um, so two new soccer pitches and in, incorporating a cricket pitch at the same time. And as we know, um, the overlap between football, AFL, and cricket is always a problem with one one of the same um, oval to use um, as they overlap the, the, their seasons. So it's really great to see the cricket pitch involved. So it's fully funded by council, these reserves, these um, pitches, and the design will be um, ready by uh, October this year in 2020 to start putting them out to tender to um, get these involved. So that's going to be a fantastic result for that for that Bunyip Reserve. But can I just mention, a, it's, it's a, um, it's, I want to talk about the Unsealed Road program. Look, at the moment, I think the, the, the staff, the team that are working on these unsealed roads at the moment under the, under the weather conditions are doing a fantastic job. Um, when, I, when I drive, when you're allowed to drive, I guess we've got to understand we haven't got the traffic on the road either these days either. So therefore, that, that would actually help our maintenance to these roads. But I would say they are bet, best condition I've ever seen in, in around, around the roads that we've got. So um, I commend them. I just want to say to you, Mr. Mayor, if you, you could pass this on to um, our CEO, to, to the um, to the road maintenance uh, crews. Um, they've done a fantastic job. I just wanted to thank them. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll leave it to other councillors if they want to bring up some more items. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Moore. Um, do I have any other councillors that would like to speak to this item? Uh, Councillor Carol Ryan. Thank you through you, Mayor. Um, yes, I'd just like to mention a couple of other projects that I'm um, very proud that's happened in, within um, Central Ward, and that's the IYU uh, Recreation Reserve. And um, some of the details is a design for a 400-metre athletics track, which has been long awaiting um, long jump, high jump, pole vault, um, discus and shot put. And they're really, really important for our future Olympics, you know. So hopefully we might produce some um, young and up-and-coming Olympics um, with that equipment and, and what is set up to be a really good environment. There's also the uh, Tumut Reserve Northern Pavilion and um, it's a redevelopment of the ground floor in the area existing um, pavilion um, and to provide nipple change facilities and um, umpires changing room and unisex uh, amenities. 
There's also the Southern Pavilion, the Tumak Reserve Southern Pavilion for the little laps and, and baseball. And again, that's another lot that's been a long time waiting for something that's a, a better facility for them to use. And uh, some of them are, are setting up changing rooms, the unisex amenities, um, accessibility to um, public toilets, um, especially disabled. I think that's one of the things that sometimes we tend to forget to mention that, you know, we do have a lot of people within our community that um, have disabilities and it's really important that we cater for that environment as well. So um, I won't go into too much detail there because I'm sure some of the other councillors in Central Ward would like to mention some of the other projects that are there. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Ryan. Um, do I have any other councillors that would like to speak to this item? All right. Councillor Brown. Waving my finger in the air there. Um, look, I just want to support what Councillor Moore said regarding the, the um, the roads, the unsealed roads around this particular area, I drive them a lot. I get a lot of phone calls which have dropped away markedly and that may be because people are not using the roads as much. But having driven them, I find that their condition is by far the best they have been uh, in the four years I've been on council. So I'd like to congratulate Ben Wood and his team, um, um, Peter Benesek people and also the project people that are in charge of these major projects because they're never too busy to to talk to you. They're never too busy to return a call when you have a when you have a question. So I think the people driving these projects need to have a big pat on the back. They're only a small team, but um, they do produce a, a hell of a lot of work and uh, all the more power to them. So I'd just like to compliment them and also um, support the fact that our roads are really good. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Uh, do I have any other councillors that would like to speak to this? Councillor Ross. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Just supplementing some of the things that are happening around the Pakenham area in particular. Many, many things have been mentioned, but the uh, Tumuk Valley Creek um, has had a, a renovation of the bridge that walks over Tumuk Creek at the northern end up near Princess Highway which was well overdue. Uh, it had done its time really well down near Rotary Park. And the new, and the new walkway bridge will, will bode us well into the long term. Also to the, um, the new bridge on the southern end, I must say I walk over there probably at least two times a day. It's really well used. There's so many more people using it at the moment, getting around the area in their one hour of walk. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't have ever walked around the other side of the creek because it was too far to walk down and around, but now they can actually walk a multiple of different ways. It's benefiting local shops in the area too, where people now, instead of walking 1.4 kilometres, they walk maybe 500 metres to some sh local shops. So they're, they're increasing, believe it or not, in COVID-19 um, a little bit with their business, which is excellent. Uh, I must say a lot of people are using those pathways more. And, and, the, and the, the bridges that are built today are built of such a good quality. Um, you can really see it when you have a look compared to the older bridges. And this has been totally funded through DCPs, through developer contribution plans. So ratepayers didn't have to put, the, put their um, hand in their pocket out of their rate money. It actually came through developer contributions through the blocks of land that were sold in the area going towards building infrastructure. So that's just a, a really good news story. And I'll leave it to my fellow councillors to share some other good news stories. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Ross. Uh, do I have any other councillors that would like to speak to this item? Uh, there being none, I'll go back. I'll go to Councillor Owen to summarise, please. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, all councillors, providing uh, updates on various projects. I just wanted to uh, just mention uh, the sealing the hills. Um, I didn't mention that before, but uh, that relates to the Australian government's investment to, to support council in, in sealing uh, 110 kilometres of unmade roads in the hills areas uh, over 10 years. So in updating the report that nine design packages, uh, 
constituting 23 roads and approximately 35 kilometres have been awarded in May and are under a, a, a way. Uh, approximately 28 kilometres of these roads are connected roads and not subject to a special charge scheme and will form the priority of construction works pending planning requirements. Final design of all nine packages is due to be delivered by late September. I just wanted to commend the, the work of officers. This is a massive amount of work. Um, you know, to seal this amount of kilometres of roads, you know, there's a lot of processes required, you know, permits for vegetation removal and, and appropriate sort of, um, uh, you know, granting of approvals from various other governments. But um, massive amount of work, so I want to thank the officers involved. But these roads are Mount Burnett Road, Morrison's Road in Pakenamuppa, Mount Burnett, Ewer Road in Jembrook and Mountain Road, Matters Road, Burks Creek Road, Shouten Road and Tumuk Valley Road, Vinac East Road, uh, Dickey Road, Telegraph Road, uh, a number of roads in Cockatoo, the, the, the starting of the construction of roads in Cockatoo when we've got the Crag, uh, Crag 21 uh, Road Actions Group uh, that uh, are heavily involved in that and, and the other committee in, in Cockatoo as well and also in Emerald. So those designs are well underway. But also I just want to quickly mention the Monash Stage 2 upgrade. Now we see in the Monash uh, is that works have started for that, that additional lane in either direction between uh, Clyde Road and Cardinia Road, but also the, the full diamond interchange at Beaconsfield. So we're, we're starting to see work start in that. And obviously this project is funded by the state government, but council is supporting supporting the relevant authorities in that because there is proposed to be really strong pedestrian connections along that stretch from, from Beaconsfield uh, through that O'Shea uh, sort of uh, connection in, into Berwick. Some great pedestrian links, which is fantastic. Um, more paths and, and great uh, cycle sort of um, um, links is, is really important. So that's great news. So thank you, everyone. Uh, and it's just a good report tonight. Thanks very much. Thank you, Councillors. Um, Councillors, I'll now put this to a vote. All those in favour, please raise your hand. I declare that carried. Thank you. Uh, Councillors, uh, that concludes discussion of the items withdrawn. Can I please have a motion to adopt the recommendations for the balance of the items listed? Councillor Jody Owen and a seconder, please. Councillor Michael Schilling. Um, all those in favour? I declare that carried. Thank you, councillors. Reports or minutes of committees. I note that reports from various committees have been received in addition to the minutes of recent council briefing sessions, and these are available if any councillors wish to view them. Uh, councillor reports. Councillors, um, does anyone have any matters they wish to report tonight? Give everyone a, a chance to think about it. I know it's been a long council meeting. Uh, any councillors? Is there anyone, would anyone like, uh, Councillor Brett Owen, please. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I just briefly wanted to say the role of councillor continues. Um, a, a number of community members um, have obviously Zoom type meetings, etc. So councillors are uh, tuning into those forums. So I think it's really important. Um, if they are, uh, and if they've got the capacity to, to continue with their meetings, so, whether it's, you know, I've been attending uh, Officer uh, District Association and, and Beaconsfield Progress Association, and, and I believe there's other forums happening as well. So the role of councillor does continue in this space, and, and that's what we continue to do, um, you know, if, if, if that sort of technology exists in uh, community uh, groups meetings. But it is hard, but, um, and I know councillors are offering other sort of forums if, if people want to contact councillors, you know, by these sort of means, you know, please do. We're still out there working for you. So uh, thank you. I just wanted to mention that. And, and we've got meetings coming up in that forum, which is good. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor yeah. Owen. Um, Councillors, do I have any other reports you would like to bring to the table? Um, there being none, we might move along. Uh, it is being a long meeting tonight. There's a lot of items on tonight's meeting. Um, presentations, petitions. Uh, Councillors, do we have any p petitions you'd like to present? Thank you. Notices of motion. We have two notices of motion to consider this evening. Um, first notice of motion, uh, 1054 received from Councillor Brett Owen. Uh, Councillor Brett Owen, can you move this please? I move the following that 
report be prepared for consideration at the September Council meeting regarding the decision to install gates at either end and upgrade the fire access track section of Mackenzie Road, Upper Beaconsfield. Thank you, Councillor Owen. And I believe Councillor Wilmot would like to second this item. That's correct, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Wilmot. Uh, Councillor Owen, would you like to speak to this item? Thank you, Mayor. Um, council officers have been working with the emergency services to review uh, these uh, fire access tracks and a program to install gates. Um, that program has been progressing, but Probably in the last two months, thereabouts, Rangers Ward councillors have received a number of emails expressing concern about the Mackenzie Road Upper Beaconsfield uh, uh, proposed gate. Um, I personally share some concerns about that gate going in, but I'm asking uh, officers to prepare a report. I understand the decision was made by a committee, which then council implements. Uh, implements and the committee is made up of other emergency services. So there's uh, you know, reasoning behind that council officer's decision um, and the support of that group. But uh, I've got questions. Um, I personally think uh, this section of road that is in question has been highly used. Um, it is a very different, challenging section of road. And I like to know the history of council maintenance, if any, on that section. But I'm concerned of the creation of uh, two dead end streets um, in that highly, um, obviously vulnerable area of Upper Beaconsfield in relation to emergency access and, and fire. And I just wanted more information about that decision, and and then council can consider that report at the September meeting. But um, yeah, it in my opinion, it's been highly used for many years. And according to a resident that I've been sort of communicating with for 40 years, um, and you know, to stop that now, um, I want some more information. So that's the, the the report that I'm asking for for councillors to consider at the September meeting. So I move so. Thank you, uh, you councillor Owen. Oh, um, I'll go to Councillor Wilmot to speak to this item, please. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, I'm. Fully supportive of Councillor Owen's notice of motion here. Um, I'm not overly familiar with this this road. I, I don't know it well, so I really would like the opportunity to have that background information um, that Councillor Owen has requested in a report, so that we can get the history and get a better understanding of how it's currently being used and what the proposal really is. Um, there is a long history. Um, that the residents have, have informed us of, um, including uh, during Ash Wednesday when some of the residents uh, used that track as an escape route as the fire came down on Upper Beaconsfield. So there is a long history and, and um, I think it, we owe the residents um, our, our due consideration of that history. Um, so I fully support this report and I look forward to it coming to our September meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilmot. Um, I'll put this out to the floor for councillors. If does any other councillor like to speak to this item, please? <clears throat> uh, I can't. I can't see anyone's hands up, so I'll um I'll go back to Councillor Bredo and to summarise. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Wilmot, for your for your comments. Uh, I'm just asking for a report on the proposed closure of the gates uh, for councillors to consider. I've got concerns about creating two dead end roads, that being Mackenzie and Tower, um, and just not having that connection through through that area of Upper Beaconsfield. Um, so um, yeah, I look forward to the report, and then councillors can determine you know what we do from that point. But thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Owen. I'll I'll put this to a vote now. Um, all councillors in favour? I declare that carried. Thank you. Councillor Ross, um, as you have declared a conflict of interest in the following matter, can I please ask that you leave the room? I, 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 Thank you, Councillor Ross. I think he has. Mm -hmm. There we go. All right. Um, next note of motion, 1055, received from Councillor Wilmot. Uh, Councillor Wilmot, can you please move your motion? Thank you, Mayor. I move the following. 
Um, following the recent publication of councillor expenses report and regarding councillor Ross's position on both the BLGA board and the Metropolitan Waste and Resource Recovery Group board, I request one, that the CEO, Ms Jeffs, be given the authorisation to contact the CEO of both organisations to gain answers to the following questions and others that she, see, that she deems necessary. A, how much are board members paid? B, what is the purpose of those payments? C, is Councillor Ross involved in any subcommittees for the organisation? D, how long has Councillor Ross been a member of the board and a member of any other committees associated with the organisation? E, how many meetings has Councillor Ross attended and been paid for as a board or committee member? And F, what dates were these meetings held? Two, the dates and information gathered is to be cross-referenced to the travel expenses and out-of-pocket expense claims Councillor Ross has been reimbursed for by Council. Three, a full audit of kilometres listed for each trip claimed by Councillor Ross is conducted using Google Map as a reference. And four, a report with all the findings is presented to the September general meeting. This report should include a recommendation as to any further actions the council may be required to take. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilmot. Um, and I have indication that Councillor Brett Owen would like to second this item. Thank you, Councillor Owen. I'll go back to Councillor Wilmot to speak to this item. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is a difficult item. Um, and this isn't how I sort of envisage this would all come about. Um, back in 2016, I moved a, a notice of motion to uh, make adjustments to our expenses claim policy back then. And one of the, um, one of the uh, um, adjustments was that we would be issued with a quarterly report that outlined all claims made by councillors. And I did this at the time because I thought it was um, appropriate for councillors to be able to hold each other accountable for what we're claiming. Um, the staff, although uh, the manager of governance processes these forms and uh, pays, authorises the payment of them, he has to take a councillor's word that what is on those forms is true and correct. Councillors sign their forms and, and in, in doing so, you are saying that those forms, the information on them is true and it's accurate. Um, so whilst they might ask for a little bit of extra information at times when it's lacking, um, they don't actually have any authority to take it much further than that. It is us as a group of councillors that have that authority. Um, the CEO doesn't have it. We employ her. Um, so she does not have that, that ultimate authority. It is only us that can hold each other accountable. Over the years, I've had several occasions when these reports come out. I've um, raised my concerns and my questions uh, with the manager of governments, and he's come back with, with different varying sorts of results. Some of them are adequate, some of them are still a bit lacking. But again, he hasn't got the authority to push it any further. It is only us as councillors. Um, so recently, Back on, I think it was the 1st of June, we got the last uh, councillor expenses report, our quarterly reports. And I guess because we've got a little bit more time up our sleeves, I sort of had a bit of a bigger look at it than what I normally would. Normally, I just look at the things that stand out and are obviously a bit questionable. But this time I had a longer look and I decided to do some comparisons on Google Map because some of the trips just seemed a little odd. Seemed odd to me that you could go to two different groups that hold meetings within the city and didn't matter where they were, it was always the same kilometre being charged. Uh, so I had to Google those groups, find out where they were holding their meeting and that's what I did. And I discovered that no, neither of them were actually the kilometres that were being charged. They were both different. One, one group is uh, stationed up in the Carlton area and the other group is right down in the World Trade Centre down near South Bay. Couldn't possibly be the same kilometres to both of those groups, and it wasn't. Um, so that made me dig a little bit further. And uh, I then had a look at the annual reports for both of those groups and found out information that I was completely unaware of. Uh, the BLGA annual report clearly states 
that their board members, which Councillor Ross is part of, are paid. They paid um, $426 per meeting. It is clearly in that report. That was something I wasn't aware of. The Metro Waste Group report, again, Councillor Ross has listed that he's been a member of that board since May 2017. I wasn't aware of that. I thought he was purely the councillor delegate at their forum meetings and their special project groups. Um, I was unaware that he was a board member for that period of time. And again, it states that they are paid, although it's not very clear what they're paid. Hence, uh, I contacted the mayor and the CEO after I thought about this information for quite a long time because it's pretty um, incredible sort of information. I wasn't sure what to do about it. But I, I contacted the mayor and the CEO a couple of weeks ago um, asking the CEO to make contact with those groups to get some further information. She didn't really feel that she was uh, in a position to do that on just the request of one councillor to uh, investigate another councillor. So um, I then sent via the CEO a email to Councillor Ross last week posing very similar questions to what's in this notice of motion. Unfortunately, his response uh, was inadequate. He uh, pretty much said, no, he didn't need to give any further information. So uh, there were several attempts made last week, all of them failed. So tonight I'm here before you asking you for your support so that we can gain some further information, have a report brought back to us. My investigation is just that, my investigation. It needs to be a more thorough re re um, investigation with all the details um, checked and, and um, unravelled, basically. So I ask for your support. We are the only group of people that can hold any councillor responsible for their actions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilmot. Um, I'll go to Councillor Brett Owen to speak to this item next. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Wilmot. Uh, I'm seconding this motion because uh, for the reasons why you, you outlined that um, you ask a number of questions. Um, and as an individual councillor, as you said, it's not appropriate uh, to individually ask the CEO for those answers, in my opinion. You need the support of the council, the collective, to give the authority to the CEO to, to do that. So that's what you've done today. Um, so, you know, to have the support of council to ask these questions is important. Also, the other element is asking for report. And I've got a, a long history on council supporting councillors when they do ask for a report on various matters. So that's why I'm supporting this motion, asking for a report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Um, I'll go to questions. Uh, Councillor Schilling. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd just like to say by, um, by highlighting that um, this notice of motion would probably be one of the hardest things um, I've probably spoken to as an elected councillor since this term has begun. And the reason why is because this notice of motion is about one of our own colleagues. Um, and I can show everyone there is no joy in speaking to this item tonight. And I can only begin to imagine tonight um, how hard it must be for Councillor Ross, his family and support networks. I'm not going to point out specific examples because as a council group, we are all privy to one another's expenses. But based on what I've seen and the allegations presented to us by Councillor Wilmot, I have reason to believe that Councillor Ross's claims do warrant an investigation. Therefore, I will be supporting this notice of motion tonight. Given the magnitude of what is being discussed, this notice of motion passes tonight. I'll, uh, I would urge the CEO to ensure the investigation takes place in a timely manner and that Councillor Ross has offered, offered support. After this, this is, after all, this is not a situation that I would wish on anybody. However, given the chain of events, I don't feel we're left with any other option other than to give the CEO the authority to conduct a prompt and detailed investigation. As gut-wrenching as it is to sit here tonight supporting this notice of motion, I believe we all owe it to our community, the very people that elected us to this privileged position. Personally, I'm hoping that all questions can be answered and perhaps there's a logical explanation for everything. But in the meantime, the community does deserve answers and we've gotten to a point where we haven't been able to get those answers. But sadly, I do believe that there's no other way than supporting this notice of motion tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Schilling. Um, 
Do I have any other councillors that would like to speak to this item? Uh, Councillor Ryan first. Through you, Mayor, um, I'm not going to go in and repeat what all the other councillors have said. I think, you know, the points are very valid and it is difficult to um, speak on behalf of um, someone that is not here to defend themselves to us. Um, but the request is to, to go further um, to see if everything tallies up. I suppose one of my questions is why is it that this councillor is targeted only about his expenses and travel when there are other councillors? And I would have been happier if we were all um, investigated um, just to clarify that we're all doing the right thing. When the forms are filled out, as um, Councillor Wiltman said, that you know, we put down what we believe is the right information and our travelling. Um, and sometimes we can go different ways. And so therefore, sometimes your travelling might be shorter than others. It depends on the traffic, especially in the city. So once you fill the forms out, then it goes to the governance. And then they check the information. And from there, you know, if there's any discrepancies, well, then you would expect um, the guidance of them to um, explain that, you know, something's not right, let's question it. If it was, wasn't was singly out one person, I'd include and include other councillors, I would um, agree to this motion. But the timing just seems with me, elections close, just as an election stunt to do damage to Councillor Ross's reputation. I think this could have been handled without coming to this stage. And I think it's made it very, very awkward for all of us councillors to even speak on whichever way we, we, we go. Um, we all want the, the right outcome and that's really what this is all about. So. Um, I won't be supporting it. Thank you, Councillor Ryan. Um, I'll go to Councillor Brown to speak to this item. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yes, look, I, I'm I'm very concerned, and uh, I feel for for Councillor Ross, and I'm sure that the CEO will involve Councillor Ross in the investigation when she gets the information. I prefer to give people benefit of the doubt. I would say or think that perhaps Councillor Ross did not know what the makeup of that allowance was, that it did include what it's alleged to have included, that he thought that he was doing the right thing. I don't think we have a, a harder working councillor. He goes to all the events, um, gives up of his time freely to represent any councillor when he's asked. It is unfortunate, the timing, absolutely unfortunate the timing how this couldn't have been done um, after the elections or even three months ago uh, is beyond me the evidence that's been submitted is compelling i must say there's been a lot of investigative work done here uh, and it's very compelling i i support councillor ross i i got a lot of time for councillor ross i would like to think that uh, if errors have been made, that's all they are, simple errors. And bearing in mind that we're only looking at the, um, correct me if I'm wrong, we're only looking at the uh, Metropolitan Waste and Resource Recovery Group and the VLGA board positions. Um, I'll reserve my, um, the way I'm going to vote until I hear Councillor Wilmot sum up. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Um, do I have any other councillors that would like to speak to this item? Uh, Councillor Jody Owen, first. Um, I don't honestly know where to start to think you could be on a council where this could even be raised. To me, is earth shattering. 
to me, along with some longer serving counsellors, we have been aware that there have been questions asked before. We have been aware that at times governance have changed things based on errors we have picked up. It is for these reasons, based on the fact that the CEO cannot do any further investigations without all councillors' support, the fact that our travel is paid by residents' rates and it is not our own money, it is for these reasons and for no publicity stunts, for nothing to do with the election, to do with integrity and us being legit, open, transparent, that I will be voting for this. And I hope that the report comes back, that there is nothing to find and we can all move on. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Um, Councillor Moore, would you like to speak to this item? Oh, thank you, Mayor. Yes, it is disturbing to have this conversation, I must admit. But there's there's evidence there. I mean, I I um, take the hat off to Councillor Wilmot for the effort that's been put into this investigation. Um, I'm a big believer of uh, Councillor Ross. I think he, as Councillor Brown said, he's a really hard-working councillor and, and he goes to a lot of things. I'm going to be a lot more things than a lot of other councillors would do. So, so I, I can see it. I would just like to know that, um, that Councillor Ross gets a, a, a fair um, hearing um, and we give him that space to have a right of reply um, to these allegations. And I, and I think they may be just, um, you know, misinformed information, um, which, ha which has happened before to a few councillors before, not just Councillor Ross. So it's, um, you know, there's, there's been occasions where the, the miscalculation has been taken place. So, look, I'm a bit mixed in between. The timing's a bit off. Um, I feel a bit gutted by by having to, to go through this uh, at this stage of our, our um, council careers, but um, it is what it is. If it's got to be, it's got to be. I mean, it is just a report. Let's let's face it. It's like um, as, as uh, Councillor Brett Owen mentioned before. It's just like asking for a report on something else, and we just need to find the results. But I just want to make sure that um, it's not a um, not a hanging, it's not a, a witch hunt, um, that we that we treat everybody fairly. And I think that there, there's a little bit of sense of mistrust here. And um, so I think that we, we should try and stick together. But I'd like to see a report and okay, let, let, let's get it all out on the table. If Councillor Ross has, um, you know, made a bit of a, you know, miscalculation or whatever, well, so be it, so be it. But I think um, I think it deserves the, um, the right of um, reply and the right of, uh, thought as well, like we all would expect the same thing. And I don't think, you know, um, um, you know, we should take it any further than probably that. That's my opinion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Moore. Uh, well spoken. And I'd just like to say well spoken on every councillor's behalf here that I've heard before us tonight. Um, I, look, I agree, I, I think, with most people's sentiments. Um, and Councillor Moore summarised it quite well then. You know, this notice of motion is asking for a report and it's not asking for a conclusive decision on on what's right or what's wrong, but it's asking for it's asking for Carol and the officers to um, you know, investigate a couple of these questions. And we will know if a report is had, then we will know information after that. And perhaps there is has been a mistake that Councillor Ross has made in the past um, or, and perhaps there's not. And it would be, as Councillor Jody Owen pointed out, it would be the best case scenario that the report is brought back and there was nothing further to see. So I agree with that. And I also agree with the sentiment that Councillor Ross is a good councillor. He's been on this council a long time. Um, you know, he is, he, is, he is a good person. So I really hope this doesn't cause um, too great distress in the background as well. But I think it is warranted that we uh, request that the report comes together um, just to ask these questions that's been posed of uh, Council Wilmot. So thank you, councillors. I'll go back to Council Wilmot to summarise. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, councillors. And just in summary, let me assure you, I 
I feel very uncomfortable doing this myself. It's not something that I want to do to any counsellor. But having uncovered what I've uncovered, I couldn't just ignore it. I, I had to do something with this information. And absolutely, Councillor Ross will be given and should be given every opportunity to um, reply to this. And I also note that this is my investigation, but it doesn't mean that it's right. I might have made a mistake. And if I have, then the investigation that I'm asking and the report that I'm asking for will, will show that. And if that's the case, then I'll be happy to apologise to Councillor Ross in full, in public. Um, so this isn't great timing. I acknowledge that just before an election isn't great timing. But it is what it is. I discovered this information a few weeks ago. I've had to do something with it. And now is the appropriate time to do it. I can't sit on it forever and hope for a better time to bring it forward. We need to do this now. And um, that's why I've done it this way. Councillor Ross has been given some opportunities to reply to questions already. He's not done that. He hasn't replied. Um, so the report that I'm asking for will give him another opportunity to come back and explain what's gone on here. And as I say, it might be my mistake. He might be completely um, above board. But again, as I said earlier, when I moved the, um, the new policy, those policies are there to protect councillors. If you fill out the forms correctly and include the details, then nobody's going to ask any more questions. Unfortunately, those forms aren't always containing the details that are required, and that leaves them open for scrutiny, and that's what's happening here. So I hope that I have the support of the majority. Um, I acknowledge that Councillor Ryan has already said that she won't be supporting it, and that is her privilege and her um, option. She doesn't have to support it. That's her her decision. Um, but I do hope that I have the majority and that we can get this report and get to the bottom of this once and for all. Thank you, councillors. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Councillor Wilmot. Um, councillors, we'll now put this to a vote. Uh, all those in favour? All those against? Uh, I declare the item carried. Thank you, councillors. Um, this almost brings us to the end of our meeting, but I, I believe I, I might have missed Councillor Moore earlier when I was calling for reports, and I, I might have missed your hand waving in the air there and skipped you. So I've got to give you an opportunity, Councillor Moore, if you wish to um, speak to any reports or committees that you wish to speak on. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. There's no need for that, really. I um, I just wanted to mention the um, the White Ribbon event that was on the other day. It was um, um, I know that uh, you were tuned in. There was a a um, few of the councillors tuned in, which was fantastic to see. Unfortunately, with the, there was a bit of technical problems there, and I don't know whether you received that or not, but I had crossed over um, the microphones, but crossed backwards and forwards, and it was a little bit sketchy, and it was um, a few people didn't, didn't actually turn up or weren't available either, which was a bit bit of a shame. But the effort that was put in by Outlook, uh, Line Leisure and uh, Cardinia together as a group um, was just unfortunate. But anyway, it was not nice to have it and, and, and attend, and it was nice to see uh, some of the councillors there um, online. That's all, Mr Mayor, that's all I wanted to mention. Thank you. Th thanks, Councillor Moore. Look, it was it was a good event. They did have some technical issues, um, and unfortunately that's why none of the uh, guest speakers, such as myself, could speak and present, because um, the links we were given didn't allow us access to that. So there was something went wrong. Look, it is difficult. We we know we've we've had these issues ourselves trying to host all these meetings and such online. It's a it's an unusual um, environment we find ourselves in. So we adapt as best we could. But they did undertake a really great initiative there to put the event together. And if Paige is out there listening, I owe her a little video piece to go to be uh, promoted for the um for the event that they are going to sort of do a bit of a tie-in thing afterwards. So uh, I'll get I'll. I'll give you a call tomorrow, Paige, and we'll get on to that because I, I know that's overdue. It's been a bit of a hectic day, I must tell you. So, um, yeah, but that is that is the life of, of councillors. You know, uh, the community doesn't realise how, how hectic it gets for us uh, councillors in Cadenia sometimes. And uh, so, <laughs> well done, everyone. Um, so, councillors. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I was going to, that, that now, councillors, that now concludes uh, tonight's proceedings. So, um. So thank you all for your attendance and I, I now declare this meeting closed. Thank you.